Hello, climbers and card sharks. My name is Devious Guy, and there's a new Legends of Runeterra expansion, which means, of course, there's a whole bunch of new lovely cards for us all to look at. Hello, everybody. How are you doing in chat? For those of you who are worried, yes, I am still recovering from an oral surgery, but I can talk now, uh, and it doesn't, like, my bleeding has stopped. I'm not taking painkillers anymore, and I should be fine. But I am going to talk a little bit carefully, as you can probably tell right now that I'm talking slowly and I'm going to try not to get overexcited because I don't want, I've still got stitches in my mouth and I don't want them to, you know, open up. So, we're going to be looking at specifically the unit cards, like there's a bunch of spells um, in the update as well. But mostly, like, spells are just these little tiny icon things, and there's rarely very much to talk about on them. Uh, except, of course, to say, oh, this guy is adorable and I love him! Um, but we're going to be talking about the units, and by my count of hand, there are, uh, between the new units that were added in the current pack of cards, as well as the Celestials, there is a total of 69 nice cards for us to take a look at, which I think is probably okay for the state of my mouth right now. We'll watch the KDA video once it drops, which it should drop in about an hour from now. I still don't know where it's going to be dropping. Uh, it's, they haven't scheduled the live stream anywhere that I know, so we'll figure it out. But once it drops, we'll pause this and we'll watch it together. So... How's the audio? Am I audible? Is the music too loud? Is everything... Is everything going... Sounding okay the way it wants to be? Alles gut? There's a little bit of delay, so I'll have to wait for your answers on that one. Sounds good. Excellent. Yeah, Gamescom is also going on, but that one, like... It's just games announcements. I'll have to... I'll have to, uh... <laughs> Make do without it. Anyway, uh, this is an FAQ in the description. In case you have, if you want to ask something, check if it's answered down there first. Um, but other than that, might as well jump right into it. Now, if you've watched my streams reviewing the card art of Legends of Runeterra before, a lot of what I'm saying is probably going to be familiar. We're going to go th over some of the same stuff. The slow mode is too high. Ah, uh, right, right. Uh, let's see if I can set that to something lower. There. That's That slow mode was for a stream when I had like 2,000 people here. <laughs> 69 and mouths, friends till the end. <laughs> anyway, as I said... If you've watched um, one of these streams before, you know that uh, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about will probably be familiar to you. Stuff like framing, stuff like using the light to highlight a character in the space, and things like that. And that's something that comes into play immediately with Diana. In fact, you can see it very visibly here, is that all of the characters in this card are in the same space. They are under the same lighting conditions, and you can see that there are like, bright highlights on the characters in the background, but none of those highlights are anywhere close to as bright as what you get, especially along the edge of Diana's blade, where the highlights are basically sheer white with a purple glow. And Diana herself is also just lit up more. And that's one of the very basics of, like, how do you create a, a crowd scene, but you still want to highlight one character well? You cr let that character literally be highlighted by light. Um... Whereas the characters in the background are just a little bit, like, they're not in shadow, but they're just a little bit less highlighted. Uh, and the same thing goes for the composition, where you can see, like, they've taken care that Diana is flanked by Solari, uh, Lunari over here and Lunari over here, but there isn't, like, any Lunari on either side where, like, you can see a face peeking out underneath her elbow or something like that, because the human eye is naturally drawn to faces. It's called pareidolia. We have a tendency to identify faces and things that don't have them. The The brain is programmed to look for faces. So if you have a bunch of faces that, like, up close to the main character that you want the attention to be on, that would be visually distracting. So you see, like, the shoulder of a character and, like, the, the silhouettes of some more Lunari who are also in the space 
but no character that has a face is crowding in on Diana's space. She has this whole center, or well, center left of the image entirely to herself, um, which is just like basic good composition. Uh, it's it's a, a very basic way of like, here here's how we create a scene where it's obvious who the most important character is, obvious who we were supposed to care about. Everyone else is obviously just an extra. If this was a movie, you would know that this was the main character of the scene. And I like the use of colors as well. We'll talk about this as we start talking about um, the Solari, but the color language of the Solari versus the Lunari on Targon is, is really, really solid because the Solari is all red, orange, gold, um, like bronze, mauve, like a lot of warm colors. And the Solari are universally identified by cold colors, by blues, purples, uh, soft hazes, pinks too, are much more of a Lunari color. And that's just like, again, in terms of world building the universe, having that very clear color coding of each of the individual factions is a really effective way to create that visual separation. And that comes into play as we get into Diana's leveled up card. And indeed, as we look at Leona's leveled up card, because these two go together. This is a battle scene. And we saw that in the most recent animated short, that this is pretty much that fight scene that uh, the, the Traveler and the Goat thing were observing. And here you can see the use of that color space, because this is Diana's side of the card. They're fighting in the sunlight, in the late golden hour, noonday sunlight. So inevitably, obviously, there's going to be some reds and oranges in here. But note how in Diana's half of the image, like the, the, where she has her feet planted, where like her arm and her sword thing is is being held blues lots of blues grays cooler like m colder colors in general and then she rushes into the sunlight but there's still that effort to bring the color coding of the lunari into her card even when it kind of conflicts with the environment that they're fighting in now if you take a close look at uh, diana's anatomy in this picture, you you might be going, uh, uh, wait, hang on, hold on, that doesn't seem to work, and that's because it doesn't. Um, it, it, it mm. so there's two things going on here. We have on the one hand an action pose, like this is an extreme action pose, um, where Diana is, where it's pretty normal when you want to emphasize, like strong action, that you break the character model a little bit, like you 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 create a pose that isn't quite anatomically possible because that extremity helps communicate the force with which the character is moving. But this is still too much for me because like her left thigh and her right thigh, like the right thigh is supposed to be going backwards because she's running towards and this is moving into the camera so there's a foreshortening thing going on. But they don't look like they're the same size at all. Like, I think the upper torso and the arms and the and the sword holding back and stuff, like, this all works, like, individually, but from the bottom down with the thighs, like, this, it's just, like, either the pose should have been pushed a lot harder, so that it's much more obvious that we're not supposed to read it as anatomically consistent, um, or else this needed, like, another pass or two to at least make it look like her thighs are the same size. I also don't understand why Riot insists so fucking hard on having thigh gap on char on female characters all the time. Like, no matter what, what pose they have, there's just always a fucking thigh gap, which is not how thighs work. Like, you can have a thigh gap, but not when you're squeezing your legs together, not when you're, like, stretching out to break into a sprinting run towards... This is... Like the color work on this card is really good, but I feel like the the action pose needed another one or two passes because this just doesn't look right. This doesn't matter so much in the card because it was just all covered up with text and it's cropped away, but this one could maybe have done with like another another two or three trips through an editorial process. Anyway, that's the first couple of cards. How's everybody doing in chat? I'm going to try and keep an eye on um, what y'all are saying. <laughs> uh, there's a super chat I missed, I think. Oh, yeah, Maya, thank you for $20. That's very generous of you. Didn't see about your surgery until now. Have some donations for being the cool art guy with the good takes. Thank you. That's very kind. 
Right. So here's a card that has engendered some controversy. <laughs> when it comes to cards with, with uh, lackluster art, this is the one that Reddit um, has been all up in arms about. And I'm not as hard on it as other people are, but I think we can, like, we can examine and explain what the fundamental problem of the image is. Um, because there's two things going on here. First of all, we have what's called a tangent. Um, and this is something that happens in artwork, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. A ta tangent lines are lines that run in uh, parallel to each other. And what's happening here is that the jawline of Lulu is reaching down, and then it's creating a tangent. Like, you can see it has the same flow as the line of her arm. Um, and the trouble with that is, when you have tangents in two-dimensional images, it breaks the illusion of three-dimensionality. In three-dimensional images, what you want more than anything is for stuff to overlap with each other, not to have a tangent with one another. Because a tangent flattens the image. And that's part one of ma what makes Lulu's face, especially here, look a little bit off. That arm should have been more in front of her face. And the reason why the artist didn't do that is probably because they wanted to preserve the expression. Like, they wanted to have this open mouth, big smile thing, and she's lifting the squirrel up. And that's where maybe the angle from which the scene is viewed should have been a little bit higher. There should have, like, some small compositional change to make it possible to preserve the expression while having that pose. Um, so that's part one of what's not really working here. Part two of what's not really working here is that the body and the head are not very well connected to each other. And this is a problem that the Yortles have in general. Um, the Yordles in League of Legends, they're these tiny little chibi creatures with tiny little legs and tiny little arms, and once you start thinking about it anatomically, it makes no sense that they can walk upright without falling over all the time because they have giant heads that no spine could possibly support. Um, so that's always a problem for an artist to navigate. And then there's the problem that you have to stay moderately on model to the League of Legends version of the character, like the one that's in the actual main League of Legends game, which means there are certain features, certain details, certain things about the character that have to be included and have to have a certain dimensionality. I think the Legends of Runeterra artists have some freedom in that regard, but it's still, like, you have to have, like, the makeup. You have to have the thing. Like, that's, that's you know, a thing that's, that's being required from Riot's side. And so the artist may have gotten a lot of feedback saying, oh, she doesn't look quite recognizable. I wish we could see her better. Could you show her face a little bit more? Could you get, like, maybe get the lips or open the mouth a little bit wider and make the head face a little bit bigger and make her a little cuter? They're, like, something like this can happen when a, a piece of art that's perfectly good gets a hell of a lot of feedback and then through repetitive processes of feedback over and over and over again, little things get introduced that make the picture not quite work anymore in order to address concerns from people who are maybe not necessarily visual artists themselves, but who are in charge of brand management and IP and, like, all the lawyers, God knows. There's so many stakeholders um, that get into this. So that's the fundamental problem here, is that Lulu's head is placed poorly in the composition as it stands, and it doesn't connect very well to her body, uh, which is, like... Yeah, that happens sometimes. And again, the, much like the Diana art, this one should probably have had like two or three more passes through editing. But there's a lot of reasons why that can happen. Anyway, compositionally, we see the exact same trick again. Lulu is literally highlighted. She's in a meadow, little creatures all around, blah, blah, blah. And a shaft of sunlight is coming down from above, illuminating a literal circle around her. She's literally being spotlighted. Turning the grass from this like cool colder, slightly colder shades of, of gray and and uh, and green into this bright, almost yellowish shining grass in the middle that highlights her and highlights her as the center of attention in the image. And you can see that playing out, especially with the squirrel as well, with the very bright highlights on the squirrel coming from the direct sunlight versus the much more muted sunlight uh, highlights on the squirrels in the background and the shadows on the squirrels in the foreground. And Outside of the problem with her face not quite fitting the body, this is actually a really nice illustration. I really I like the pose. I like the storytelling that's happening in the scene. This is clearly someone 
that Lulu has just transformed into a squirrel. You can see, <laughs> you can see their boots on the ground. That you, for someone who's clearly a lot bigger than this poor squirrel, which implies that all the other squirrels in the scene are also human beings, that Lulu has transformed into squirrels, perhaps forever. <laughs> which is dark. Uh, I mean, I wonder how many people like end their lives being eaten by a wolf or something because they were turned into a squirrel and they don't know how to be a squirrel, so they just get murdered immediately. <laughs> So, moving on to her level up, Art, where she has apparently constructed for herself a rav ravenous squirrel army with which she's planning to take over the world. Also, eggplants and stuff. Um, but again, note the use of lighting. We have all these, like, much bluer, much colder hues over here with all the little creatures and critters. And then over here bright yellow sunlight. You can you can almost draw a direct, like a straight line down here that separates the foreground where Lulu is from the background where all her little companions and creatures are. Um, and again, compositionally that works very, very well. And here in the leveled up art, you can see the head works better with the body because it doesn't have that tangent issue. It doesn't have, like, uh, it, the body is a little bit larger, I think, actually, in relationship to the head, which ameliorates some of the disproportionality a little bit. And Lulu's character model in-game, by the way, has much worse anatomy than any of the art we're looking at here right now. In-game, Lulu is, like, she looks kind of awful when you actually look at her character model because she's designed entirely to be looked at from the top down. But yeah, again, the composition here is really obvious. Also, note that we're dealing with a Dutch angle here. Now, a Dutch angle, and we've talked about this extensively uh, in the other videos, is an angle like this. It's a little bit more obvious here, where the horizon line is not horizontal. It's not horizontal to um, what we've got going on here in the center. <clears throat> it's essentially, if it was a camera, you tilt it a little bit. And this can do a few things. It can help with an action scene like this one, for example, by giving us a sense of, like, almost as though you are running in front of her and you two are, like, twisting and tilting and, like, things are moving fast. Usually when a human being sees the horizon line at this angle, it's because they're falling over. It's because something is, something is happening. So in an action shot like this one, it helps heighten the sense of movement and and speed and gives the sense of of the world being unbalanced a little bit by the action that's happening but in a scene like this one where we have a very quiet scene this is like a quiet prayer scene or a reflection diana preparing to go into battle perhaps an angle like that wouldn't really work because it creates this sense of unease um it creates the sense of of unsteadiness that you don't want from a scene that is much more about here's a quiet moment where we're reflecting on our faith in our God, like, ah, you, it's, it's a very different thing. So there's times to use it and times not to use it. With Lulu, though, this is not exactly an action scene, so why use it? Well, because the dirty little trick of using a, a tilted angle like that is that, well, as you may know, the diagonal of a rectangle is longer than the, the, the sides of a re rectangle pretty obvious. But what that also means is that when you create a little bit of a tilt, a little bit of an angle, you get a bunch of extra space um, to widen the image, to widen the space of what's being shown in the frame. Because you're always constricted by the size of your frame, which is like, as you can see with, with, with the cards here. So the artists, when they're creating the cards, both have to keep in mind the question of framing the card itself, like that there is this border within which the relevant art for the character has to fit. But also, like, how can you show a really big, wide, expansive world, which is what we want here. We want the sense of her coming out of these great big woods followed by a huge army of creatures. Well, you can tilt the angle a little bit and get a little bit of extra space for yourself and kind of open up certain areas. You sacrifice some of the top of the image a little bit um, on one side, but you open up a little bit of extra room to get a sense of wideness. Um, that help? No, no, there is, there is an angle here. Like, the ground is not level 
in this image at all. And you can see that if you just look at where the center of gravity for the buff squirrel is, it's this way. He's not standing straight up. It's it's this way. Which leads us on to, <laughs> again, a focus on the abject horror of what Lulu does to people. And this uniform, something about this reminds me of Noxus, I think. It has a slightly little bit of, of like... Um, a little bit of, of Vladimir aesthetic, actually. Um, but here we get to the uh, to another chestnut. If you've watched these streams before, we get to framing, where in order to highlight a character, in order to center them in a composition, even if they are not actually in the center of the composition, but in order to make them the focus of a composition, rather, you can create a frame around the character. And that frame is defined by like the rocks over here, then there's the edge of the jacket coming down here, and then like the rock formation in the background with the plants and then the tree branch. All of this creates this little space in the picture where you have this bright light in the background that allows the squirrel itself to stand out um, and be contrasted against and makes them the center of the composition. And everything over here, the jacket, it's secondary details. It's still there, it still matters, but instantly when you see the picture you know that this is where your focus is supposed to be and he even seems to be in the midst of the process of transforming into a squirrel so if you're a furry who's into tf i imagine this must be very exciting oh uh crazy alpaca thank you first time donating something i really like your content and wanted to support you a little keep up the awesome work you're doing great thank you that's very kind of you all right, uh, let's see. Here's Leona in her level one art. And again, some of the same principles um, that work for Diana. In fact, it's it's kind of the same storytelling. We have this quiet before the storm as the characters like commune with the members of their faith and, and their community and are clearly like having some kind of, of, of moment of preparation. And then in the level up artwork, we have Leona and Diana actually being in battle with one another. So with Leona here, some of the same things are happening that were happening in Diana Splash Art. Now she's not highlighted. Like there's not she's not highlighted by literal light, which is interesting given that she's the sun character. But there's still the same thing of if there's any faces that are gonna be close to her, that are gonna be like in her space, they're gonna be blocked out by the shield, they're gonna be like faded out by the sun, they're going to be in the background, so that there's not a lot of faces crowding Leona herself. There's only, there's only really Leona and the sword bearer that's bringing her her zenith sword. Those are the only two real characters in the scene. If this was a movie scene, the, the this would be the, like, the main character of the scene, and this would be a secondary character, and everyone else would just be extras um, for the purposes of this shot. Um... And they're using the backlighting here. As someone actually points out in chat, she's backlit and still somehow the most visible. And that's kind of the point here. Because these characters, theoretically, Leona and the shield bearer and the person preparing her over bearers over here should be backlit in the same way because they're practically standing next to each other. But what the artist is doing here is letting the backlighting wash out the two shield bearers, but not wash out Leona at all. Um, normally, if you're staring into the sun right here, and if you do that with a camera, any character in the scene, because the camera is trying to adjust for the exposure of the sunlight, any character is going to be incredibly dark in the scene. So, because this is artwork, we don't have to act like a camera, so we can cheat a little bit and have her be in a neutral lighting, basically. She's lit very neutrally, kind of flatly a little bit, which makes her stand out in the scene because that's a contrast to how the light is affecting literally everyone else in the scene, except Leona, except the sword bearer. Everyone else is washed out. Everyone else gets overpowered by the sun. Everyone else is hidden away visually a little bit. And then the actual main characters come into focus. So the same compositional tricks are being used here. And it works really well. Like, you, you do definitely get the scene of this is like a momentous occasion of Leona. Leona is taking up her sword and shield. This is a big deal. This shit matters. Um, so we have to have a bunch of people watching her get dressed, basically. Now, I'm a little bit annoyed that Leona didn't receive a real visual update. Um, 
because that's something they've done actually with another champion that we're going to be looking at in a second. Um, given them, like, they, they've done that in Legends of Runeterra before, where they've, like, s just given a few visual updates to a champion to make them make a little bit more sense. And for Leona, it's still, she still has a spike here, like, that points into her sternum. She still has, and I don't know, like, I, on, on Leona's original model, these streamers here, they're supposed to be solid gold. Like, they're supposed to be rigid metal. And I think that's also how they behave um, in-game. But here, the artist has clearly made the decision that, no, these things have to be made of something soft. Like, they have to be fucking cloth or something, because otherwise, how the hell can she move? Um, so, you know, that's nice. But I do wish they would have updated her character design a little bit more, because she's always had one of the weaker tank character designs in League of Legends. Like, she needs... This doesn't look like armor. Because this, like, the the thing she's got here, the red suit thing, that's cloth. And we can even see that. We can see the seams on her arms. This is cloth. So she's wearing cloth with these soft cloth things, with a, which are gold painted. Like, the same thing as the streamers down here. And then, like, a tiny little boot plate. And then big shoulder guards. And, like, she should look like she's wearing armor, though. Like... I know she has a big shield, but she should look like she's wearing armor, though. That's the basics of character design when it comes to a tank character. And I kind of wish that they just would have given her, like, a fucking breastplate or, like, something that actually looks like it could take a hit. But, you know, it, that's it's her character design. Okay, fine, whatever. Uh, that's the way the cookie crumbles, I suppose. So, here we get into the battle scene, and again... Very obvious use of the tilted angle to widen the space and to create imbalance. But there's a couple of interesting things. The video for KDA just went up 33 minutes. Okay, cool. I shall go and find the link to that. Give me a second. I'm just going to have it ready so that once the KDA video drops, we can watch the, the premiere altogether. Let's see. Where the hell is it? Is it on Twitter? I know people, I think people can't post links in the chat, so. Uh. Yeah, there's the link. I found it. It's being premiered on, on the League of Legends channel, right? Yeah, there it is. I've got it. It's, okay, it's just going to sit there and wait for us. Cool. Where were we? Right. There's the tilted angle, but there's one other thing going on here as well. Take a note um, of the contrast between Leona. This is the same scene. Contrast how they are posed in the image between the two scenes. Here, Diana is practically eye level with us, right? Like, if if you imagine yourself positioned as, like, the camera guy in this scene, Diana is practically on your eye level. Like, she's looking you essentially straight in the eyes, which is part of what makes her intimidating, is that she's coming right the fuck at you. Uh, and you should probably be worried about that. Leona is a very different thing. Leona is not on your eye level at all. She's above you. And that's where all the step on me mommy comments that are currently being held by the automatic filter in my YouTube chat are coming from. Um, she's dominating. She's posed above you. You are looking up at her from below. Essentially, what's going on here is a contraposto... Uh, contra that's not what it is. But a, um, a, a contrasting cut, essentially. Uh, where we're seeing Leona from Diana's perspective, and we're seeing Diana from Leona's perspective. This is what Leona sees as she looks down at the opponent that's charging at her. This is what Diana sees as she's charging at Leona. Leona is standing above her, waiting for her to come at her. Um, and that's, that's the very effective way to create this double champion dynamic, because Leona and Diana are very much tied together in the lore. And they're tied together as champions. They have a lot of voice lines for each other. And also, in-game, a Solari Lunari deck for Targon seems to be a viable... Well, maybe not, uh, like, high-level viable, but seems to be a viable idea. Oh, there was another super chat. Um... Uh... Hey, TV Scan, really enjoying your content. Keep keep on going. Please give my man Tarek some love. Greetings from Germany. I'll give... I'll do my very best. So that, that, like, that creates a connection between them on the artwork level, as well as the one that there is on the lore level. And this is actually a really challenging thing to draw, 
for an illustrator to have this foreshortening that goes into the frame from above that still does like so that where you can still recognize that the sword is the zenith blade without foreshortening it too much and still have this sense of looking up at someone who's standing high above you which is also by the way leona's position in the lore is that the solari are dominant and the lunari are the insurgents they're the rebels trying to take back um control over targon so compositionally, it works well. And again, there's a framing. It's a little bit more subtle than it was on the squirrel, but it's still there. You can see the, the sun thing monument here in the background leads down into these cliff faces so that Leona's, the top of her body, her face, is framed in this bit of open sky with the sunlight behind her, um, which again creates these separations in the image that makes it a little bit more easy to parse from a compositional perspective, and helps make the angle work as well. If you didn't have the background elements to kind of ground you so that you understand what the camera angle, air quotes, is supposed to be, then it would, it, like, have just drawing Leona without the background, she would look like she was leaning over in a really fucking weird way. Like, it, it wouldn't work quite as well without the background image, background to, to kind of ground you. So, let's have a look at chat for a second. Uh, yeah, I see horny chat is in full effect. Yeah, that always happens. Try not, try not, try not get too horny. Like, be, be, be considerate. There might be minors. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> For those who are asking questions, I am taking care of my voice. This is why I'm talking very slowly and carefully. I'm taking care of my voice. It's okay. And if it gets bad, I'll stop. Don't worry. Like, I'm not going to hurt myself. I'm only horny for Aurelian Salt. Yeah, well, we get to him. We'll get to him. I wish I could say step on me, mommy. But Leona is literally my mother's name. Oh, boy. That must be complicated. <laughs> so, no. Anyway, love your stuff. Keep it up. Thank you. Oh, chat is going fast. See, because the thing is, YouTube's auto-moderation holds the word horny. Like, if you say horny, there's a decent chance it's going to be auto-filtered, and then I have to manually allow the message to show. <laughs> so try not to say horny too much, because then I have to click on chat all the time. Anyway, moving on to Nocturne. And here is what I was talking about with Leona. Some champions have actually had slight redesigns in Legends of Runeterra to bring them a little bit more up to snuff to make them um, a little bit more, look look a little bit more like modern League of Legends champions. And Nocturne, for a good long time, has always been a bit of a fart. Like, he's just been like a floating cloud of gas that has blades on and looks kind of goofy and dumb because he's a really old character model and they designed him a long time ago when they didn't really know what he was supposed to be. This Nocturne has not had fundamental changes to the character. Like, it's still the same with, this, like, the arm-mounted blades, and, like, he's still a gas creature of some some description. It appears that once enough souls have been shaking, it breaches our worlds. Only hope can send that monstrosity back to its realm, but hope died here long ago in a queen's final breath and with a king's eternal scream. Yeah, that's the Shadow Isles. Um, but there's been a color change. Nocturne in the base game is much more red, whereas he's been turned much more purple now, which is a much more unnatural, not much more scary, ghosty color kind of thing um, than red is. And he's been made a lot more skinny, a lot more explicitly. Like, he essentially looks like a kind of desiccated corpse a little bit. Um, he, he looks dried out and withered, and he has these long, bony, spiky fingers like, ah. So the, the character design hasn't been fundamentally reworked, but a lot of detail changes have been made to make him actually look scary. No, Nocturne is not from the Shadow Isles. Not at all. It's just that the person, Jens Tommen guy, he is on the Shadow Isles. Um, but Nocturne is a demon. He has existed for a very long time. Long before the Shadow Isles existed. Um, so there's some changes that just make him look more intimidating and scary. But he's still, like, he's still... Nocturne is supposed to be a demon of nightmares. Like, specifically of nightmares. And 
yeah, this looks scarier. This looks more like a like a para sleep paralysis demon kind of thing, but it still doesn't look like a night. It, it, like no, a nightmare is all about creeping deep psychological horror and unknowable dread and this like feeling that everything is terrible and wrong, even if you can't define what it is. But Nocturne is like, I have giant fuck off blades and I'm gonna stab you, and that's not the same as nightmare horror. That's just he's gonna stab you horror. So I hope he gets a rework at some point soon, because he desperately needs it. Anyway, framing once again, the mob of creatures, the gas, and the tree itself, especially the tree, which is essentially pitch black, creates this cut across the image that creates this kind of space right here for Nocturne to occupy, where again, much like with Leona and Diana, there's no other creatures around him that are close enough to take the focus away from him. They're in the frame, but they're not close enough to crowd him or um, edge him out as the main character of the image. Which again is, is a, a very simple compositional trick. There's also an interesting color contrast being worked here, because this seems to be a scene from the Shadow Isles, as far as I can tell. And we have the characteristic bluish-greenish um, Shadow Isles light glow in the backgrounds right around here. And that is contrasted really well with the purple light that Nocturne is using. The Shadow Isles are much more identified with teal, blues, per, uh, uh, not purples, but greens, and then like uh, washed out colors. They're not, they don't, often don't have super saturated color in, 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 a lot of, in a lot of what's going on. Nocturne has this very different aesthetic. This is clearly like, yeah, he's a nightmare demon and he might be on the Shadow Isles, but the purple color kind of marks him out as not an undead. Like, he's not a creature of the Black Mist. He's something else that's also horror-themed, but not in quite the same way. Again, here we have compositional framing. So, the debris and the rocks and the everything creates a literal barrier through the image. It creates a literal visual separation between these poor dead adventurers, who are definitely going to die, and Nocturne hovering above them, getting ready to strike and kill them. So there is visually in the image this separation between them, as though they are not quite in the same space, but Nocturne is also positioned above them, dominating them, reaching in to their space, which you can see in the lighting on his hands. You can see that his hands are lit up with the light from the campfire, um, and, and his upper arms, which means that he's reaching over the wall that's protecting these guys. He's reaching over the wall and getting ready to crash down on them like a vengeful wave. So he has this dominating posture. He's essentially T-posing a little bit up here with the arms spread out, grasping, like essentially stealing the whole center of the image. You, you can kind of draw a circle around this composition right here where Nocturne is just about to eat everything up that's in the, in the middle of all of this. Um, which, again, creates the sense of him as terrifying, as standing above, as, as, like, as being more powerful than the poor little creatures. And the human beings are also just small in the image. They may be very tall and buff and whatever as, as people, but in this image, they are very, very tiny, and Nocturne is as big as all of them combined, and then some. Which, again, helps sell the, oh, these guys don't know how fucked they are kind of vibe and feeling. And again, greenish glow, Shadow Isles aesthetic in the background, and then bright, saturated purple on Nocturne to mark him out as different. So, two interesting things happening in this image. Um, we have the Dutch angle again, and again here... This is probably to sell the idea of, of, like, this is Tiari, who's coming up the stairs and approaching Tarek. To sell the idea that this is the last bit of a struggle on a very long climb up Mount Targon. But also, again, to widen the space, to give you more of that brilliant star field, to give you more of the mountain. If this had been, like, a completely flat, horizontal line, then a lot of the top of the mountain would be cut off, and you wouldn't get quite as much... Um, of, like, the sense of grandeur and scale. Anyway, another interesting thing is that Tarek is really small in this picture. Like, compare the size of Tarek in the image itself 
with even like the size of Lulu, who's tiny in this image. Like she's taking up essentially a third of the screen space. But what's interesting about Tarek's uh, level one art is that he is like kind of small in it, which is interesting. He's still, you can still see him as the central character. Um, although he shares the spot spotlight a little bit with Tiari here, who we will discuss as we go along. But, um, what was I think? Right, but he still has more of like he has this uh, position on the stairs. He has the gems highlighting him. You can see they are literally highlighting him. The gems glow is highlighting him. He's got the mace. All of that helps center him as the main character of the image. But this character is also pretty important. We'll get to Tiari's story later, but let me just, I'll just tell you that this is near the end of their journey. Um, they are about to ascend to the top of Montargon, where something interesting is going to happen. And Tarek might be one of the last challenges on the climb, or he's there to help them, who knows. Um, so this is also partly Tiari's story, which is why Tarek isn't necessarily the biggest thing in the image. The level up art, on the other hand, is much more traditional. Like that, yeah, he takes up much more of a prominent space. You can see the 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 gate in the background here, the apex, whatever the hell it is, very much framing him. He can fly apparently, which is a new power that I didn't know Tarek had before. Um, he's highlighted. He's like here. You can really see the image working to put Tarek in the center of the of of attention with the glow and with the everything, the big purple Fabio. Let's see, I think I got some donations. Uh, looking forward to more serious videos like the Silas one. Noxus, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, keep up the good work. Don't push your voice too much. I'll try. Tarek looks like he's about to beat your face in. <laughs> yeah, he does, doesn't he? I think maybe someone sent me a donation on Streamlabs that didn't go through. Hang on, let me check. Just a second. I don't want to miss people's donations because, like, they 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 paid for those. Yeah, there's definitely one. Oh no no okay I got it I got it okay right I've it was just a different place. Cool. Speaking of characters that people are horny for, <laughs> Trundle looks a little bigger, doesn't he? Like, he, he has bulked out some since his update. I guess years of being the Troll King must have been good for him. Um, But yeah, here again, same principle as with Leona and Diana. There's no other face. There's no other, like, identifiable character as such crowding Trundle. He's backed by all of these powerful trolls, but he's the only character. He's also in the center of the image, like the very center of the image. And if you take a look at, if you try and draw lines from and through various features, like this line of the, of the, the trolls up here, and the cliff and the trolls up here, and then like the line across the top of this little bit of rock, Everything kind of points you, keeps sort of guiding your eyes towards the center of the image. Which is where Trundle is, which is what puts him in the center of this composition, because everything else just leads to him. Because everyone's looking at him, everyone's looking to him. He is the leader, the king of trolls, at the very center of the image, gazing out with determined whatever, at whatever he's about to fight, I guess, with his giant club. One thing I think is a little bit, like, uh, I remember the True Eyes Club that he wields being really long. I kind of wish I could see it poking out from behind his back over here, because it's clearly foreshortened, like it's going behind his back and it's, like, poking backwards a long way. But I feel like it would be nice to just be able to, like, see it over his shoulder or something like that, because right now it just looks a little bit short. Um... But yeah, it, the Trundle also has a posture that says, I am the king. Like, this is this is a dominance posture. He's got the leg up, like literally stepping, stepping forward, stepping up. And he's got this wide chest, open arms out to the sides kind of thing that where he takes up a lot of space, and that makes him dominant in the frame. Um, which works very well for him. 
But yeah, in terms of changing character designs in Legends of Runeterra, this is clearly a much older Trundle. Like, Trundle that we have in the main game is, I think, younger. Someone who has only recently found the Ice Club. Whereas this Trundle <clears throat> has clearly been king for a while. Like, he's been king for a while. He's comfortable in his position. He has extra regalia. He's got extra bits of costuming and stuff. This is a more experienced, uh, older daddy troll king as... as as Chad is hip, happy to point out. <laughs> so again, um, no Dutch angle. Everything is completely horizontal. This is a scene of stillness. And then here, this is a scene of action. And here you can see the, the ground level is tilted. Once again, as we see trolls charging in on what's probably an Avarosan village, if anything, uh, seems most likely. And here, lighting and color are being used especially to highlight Trundle, because you can see all the other ice trolls, which theoretically have the same skin color as him, have very different skin colors than him, because he has this bright, almost glowing blue turquoise as he's charging into battle. This guy is practically gray, and this guy is practically gray, so he has this color contrast where they have the same... Like, you can tell this is supposed to be blue skin, just under different lighting conditions, but Trundle lights up like a candle in the middle of the scene. He also has the brightest highlights, um, especially around, like, when you look at the separation between the guy behind him here, that's being separated out by this really bright edge lighting and highlights along along the edge of him as he's charging forward into battle. Does Doing a really good job just with color and with light to separate out one character, but he still looks like he's charging in, like, in a group with the others. He doesn't look like he's charging out alone. He looks like he's charging in the... In, in the middle of the melee, in the middle of the group. So you separate him out, you make him stand apart without actually rendering him as being that far apart from all the other characters. And as people in chat are pointing out, yeah, he has kind of a Ganondorf look going on here, um, which I think is interesting. And I do like the chaos. Like, I like that the scene, we're not just getting them charging. This is the moment when they hit the village. Like, we see this giant troll crashing down um, this tower right here, and like this, this they have reached the village. Battle is now joined. It is not the charge; it is the charge right as it strikes, which I think is a good action scene um, and works really well. I also love the diversity in character design among the trolls. Like they're all big, giant, buff dudes, obviously, but there is a certain level of like you can see that like they have different hair colors, they have different scars, they have different noses, they have different helmets on. There's some effort being put into the costuming of these characters, which I appreciate. It would be easy just to render them all as being like the same guy 15 times. But effort was put into making sure that that didn't happen. There was a super chat. Oh, Ignis, 50 euros. Thank you. We missed you, mate. Thank you very much. And Trundle is king, despite being small for a troll. He's not small for a troll anymore. This guy is fucking huge. Tarek can fly with the power of friendship. Yeah. <laughs> and he looks like he's about to beat your face. At yeah, he, I think he's acting as a challenger to Tiari in that first image. Anyway, here, this picture is about the ice pillar. Um, that's what the card is. It's Trundle's ice pillar. He's, he gives you that in hand when you play him. Trundle is here. And you can see he's a little bit highlighted. He's got some edge lighting. He's a little bit brighter than the other trolls in the image. But the center character of the image is the ice pillar itself. And you can see, again, this valley, this, like, the rocks and stuff create this sort of center frame for the ice pillar to occupy. And it's also the brightest uh, object in the entire image. Everything else, even the Avarosans that are close to it, are being... Uh, like, uh, in shadow, relative to the glow of the ice pillar, you can see, like, literally the ground glows white as it bursts through from below. Um, which, again, simple compositional tricks to make it work, but you still get this image where the pillar itself is the central character. Are people in chat being horny for the pillar? Really? <laughs> Should have known. Jesus. This is just gorgeous. Like... Aurelian Soul. There's a reason I chose this as a thumbnail, because... God damn, the colors on this thing, man! Absolutely beautiful. But we'll um, talk about that. Give me a sec. <laughs> so. 
Aurelian Sol is an interesting character to try and draw because Aurelian is technically supposed to be like the size of a planet, like he's ve or a moon at the very least. He's very, 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 very large. Um, and communicating that scale is kind of a difficult thing. And in this image, they don't try. Like, how big is Aurelian Sol? Probably large, but we don't know, like, we don't have anything to scale him against here, which is clearly an intentional choice. This is Aurelian Sol. You can see his tail snaking behind him in this spiral motion, which I think is really cool. Um, this is Aurelian Sol moving through space, doing space dragon stuff, I guess. Um, but there's no attempt to scale him, to, to say this is how big he is relative to, like, anything else relative to you. Here, there is an attempt, because this is probably the tip of Mount Targon um, that he's got a hold of here. And here you can see a little bit, it's like he's, you can almost see, like, the glow of the atmosphere below him, as though he's, like, hovering on the edge of outer space, looking down on this tiny and significant little planet, grasping the tip of the highest possible mountain. We'll read the text chat, don't worry. Which is interesting, because, like, one of the defining features of Aurelian Sol is his enormous, overwhelming, cosmic size. But these these arts right here don't make that much of an effort to portray that. Like, that's not really what they're about. They're much more about the colors and what colors they are. So Aurelian himself, we've got these deep, dark, like, night sky blue running throughout, like, the base of his transparent body. Then you have that accented with purples. Lots of purples, lots of, like, little little purple glows around the edges, little purple accents around his uh, tiny little toes. Little purple glows around everything. And then the purple glow of his mane, his hair, whatever the hell that is. And then you have the gold. Like, these are the three primary colors of Aurelian Sol. You have blue, you have purple, you have gold. You have a bright icy blue for his claws and for his bony face, but those are the three primary colors. And they are being used very, very effectively in this image. Because you can see here with the stars that he's got flying around him, they're being contrasted with their bright, glowing, orangey, golden uh, light against the relatively darker purples and blues of the background. And I love the swoop. Like, I love the swoop on this one. Like, that, that smooth, curving line really giving the sense of these things swirling around him and following him like they're orbiting a star, which is actually... And they're also royal colors, yes, as Temple of Soup points out. They're very royal colors, and Aurelian Sol, of course, thinks of himself as essentially a monarch, essentially royalty. <clears throat> and this is gorgeous. And then I love his pose, because Aurelian Sol, of course, is a space dragon. Like, he doesn't really... He doesn't have anatomy in the same way that a human would, so you get this tail that curves and swirls in this spiral behind him. And then you get this amazing curve, where, like, his body, it goes up this way, and then it just cracks in half and takes him back down. These amazingly broken, powerful curves that define his movement, and that just... It makes for a really nice composition. It makes for a creature that looks really special, really different. Anyway, his text... I don't care what you write about me, you middling creature. Just make sure I'm described as handsome and magnificent and also very, very intelligent. Can you spell that? Aurelian Sol is handsome and magnificent and also very, very intelligent. <laughs> so, this image. Um, here again... You see the curvatures that are being used, like those amazingly, like, flowing, almost calligraphy, calligraphy curves that he's got going on all around him. And you see how the stars that are swirling, like this one here and here and this one here and here, you see how they kind of, they almost kind of make a cut in the image like so. They, they too, help create this little bit of framing um, that centers him in the image. And, of course, he's also just the actual center of the image. And yes, as someone in chat is pointing out, intelligent is misspelled, which is a clever little detail. Um, but he's also completely centered in the image. Like, everything else in the image revolves around him. Everything else in the image, like, centers him as the focus. 
And I think this is Targon he's attacking because it seems to me like he's kind of trying to pierce through a barrier here. Like this, this golden glow around his fingers as though he's trying to poke his hands through some kind of protective something something. I'm not sure what exactly it would be. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I just love the colors. This is just really, really beautiful. Like, this is just gorgeous. If they sell prints of this, I want one. And so we finally move on to creatures. <laughs> and what I really like about this card is that you look at the card art, just the card, and it's like, oh, look, tiny, adorable little furry forest creature. Look at her. She's so cute with her little dress and things. And then you look at the actual art where it's like, oh, Jesus Christ. Ah! <laughs> um, which is like, it's just a good reveal. Like, it's a good little, oh, that's what that is. Uh, she's got a monster flower. That's funny. Anyway, lighting, once again, you can see the lighting, the brightness is all on this side of the image. There's very little bright light over here. Centering the character, making her the main character of the image, even in spite of the monster flower that's chewing on things. Um, and then the colors as well. Brighter, more warm, more uh, sort of gentle and friendly over here. And here they're much more cold much more drab, a little bit less saturated, and that again helps create the composition. I think there's a little, like the foreshortening is maybe a little bit extreme on the flower here. I'm not sure it 100% works with the perspective, but it kind of doesn't have to. The point gets across. She looks like an Animal Crossing villager, doesn't she? Okay, KDA's in three minutes. Keeping an eye on the time. So, remember Tiari? Remember the that character who's in Terex, uh level 1 art? Yeah, he's here too. I think this is him, them, at this point. Um, but this this is the character this is the beginning of their journey. The gift giver meets them at the base of Mount Targon before they make the ascent. They say the protector bless these gems, wear them and he shall be with you in spirit. So these are gems that are associated with Terex. And if you wear them, hopefully you will have Terex protection if you as attempt the ascend ascent of Mount Tarkon. And as far as I can tell, um, Tiari and his companions are all supposed to be diff from different places in Rune Terra. Like, they're not all Demacians, they're not all whatever. Um, they're supposed to be from various places um, in the country, and they're all climbing the mountain together. I do like her character design a lot, like with the red hair and and the the dark. I like like when there's people of color in League of Legends in general. Is fucking too few of those, but it's it's a nice choice of colors. You have this bright right shock of red hair contrasting with the purple and blue of her, of the gems in a really nice way. Um, and again, look at at the framing. You have like the cliff face and the character over here, and then you have the big guy over there receiving the gift, and they create this space right here, this frame that our central character occupies, and we only get to see her face. Everyone else is turned away from the camera. Like, you can kind of see the eyes, sort of vaguely a little bit, but hers is the only real face in the image. So she's the central protagonist, like the, the, the central character of this shot. Um, and again, highlighted with like the bright white on her cloak over top of her. And we'll talk about the Lunari Duskbringer in a second. But for now, I think... It's time to wait for the KDA. I should probably turn off my own music. And do a little bit of sound management. Give me a second. Okay, you may want to turn your headphones down. Because there's going to be hold music on this thing, loud hold music, and I have turned the audio, the, uh, the the background audio up, so it's going to be a lot louder for you now. So turn down your headphones, try not to blow yourselves out. There's going to be some loud noises coming from this in just a second. I'm going to put it in full screen as soon as I can. Time to wait and see. Surprise, Seraphine reveal. You think? No, I think Seraphine isn't going to be in this one. That would be my prediction. I think she's going to be... Uh, th I, this is the announcement of an album. Is what I think is going to be happening. And Seraphine is going to be a feature on one of the singles. And I have to imagine Seraphine is going to show up at Worlds. 
Like, I think that's what they're positioning her for, is that she's going to show up as a surprise feature um, on their performance at Worlds in China. I think that's what they're going for. I don't think she's necessarily going to show up right here. Hey, KDA isn't Judasing the harrowing this year. Yeah. <laughs> so, guess we'll just wait for the thing to actually happen. Let me just get rid of my... Seraphine is Chinese? No, she's not. She's probably going to be Ionian in the game. In the lore, rather. <laughs> yeah, Pent Pentacle was supposed to have a single this year. It was supposed to have. But they didn't. Because COVID. I'm going to shut up now and just let the music play. Once the music video is over, we'll talk about it. Sorry, 
fuck you in the best Under the jean, make out your mark Look at the gold, all on my chest Look at the gold, call it a flex Well That was shorter than I thought <laughs> Sudden ending Anyway Let me just uh, da, Poof, there we go well, that was KDA. Let me just get my audio back in order. There we go. That was pretty decent. It was more of a normal-ass single, but it's like, nothing is gonna be pop stars. Nothing. Like, nothing is gonna be pop stars again. It, that, that was a fucking once-in-a-lifetime mega-hit kind of thing that happened. Uh... God knows how the fuck they made, managed to make it happen. And the music video was a huge part of what made that song so good. Like, that, what made it so appealing and so iconic. There's absolutely no way they were going to match that with whatever the next single was going to be. So, no surprise. I don't think it's going to be as hype. But I think a lot of people are going to be doing TikTok dances to it. And I think probably, as people are mentioning in chat, they're setting up for a music video later. Like, this is a, this was the pre-release single. Um, so... And I think I saw, like, there was that one shot of Akali with some gold chains on her that, to me, looked like probably a preview of what the music video is gonna look like. Like, it, it seemed like that was a 3D model doing something that was taken out of a different context. So I think that's probably the music video that they're gonna release eventually. But they're treating this basically like an album release for the band and doing what pop stars do in the real world, which is to release a, 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 a lyrics video first and then a music video later in order to, like, build hype twice. And I'm going to be interested because, like, the YouTube compression makes, like, modern pop music especially sounds fucking awful on YouTube. And it probably sounds even worse to you guys because you're being passed through YouTube compression twice in order to hear it on my stream. Um, YouTube compression fucks with music. It makes it absolutely terrible. So I'm going to be interested to hear it as an actual, I guess, as a proper release without the YouTube compression on the audio. Because the bass sounded really flat. And, like, the, the high is, it sounded really flat and kind of boring in a lot of ways. And that's probably, um, that's probably what's, what's f making it sound kind of not that pumping up. Anyway. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, there's probably, Seraphine is going to do a cover of it, I'm sure. I'm sure Seraphine is going to have something. Like, the Seraphine Twitter account is going to post a cover of it. <sighs> anyway. I think there was some super, uh, super shit. <clears throat> Gonna play that song every time my team calls me out for feeding. Yeah. Like, I think the song was designed very much to be used in highlight reels and TikToks. Um, so. Anyway, where were we? Right. The Lunari Duskbringer. Which is an interesting card just from a, like, a tactical perspective. Because you get, essentially you get the ability to reduce by one the cost of any unit that has Nightfall, which, theoretically, should allow you to play the Stygian Unlooker for zero, if so you can use Spell Mana to cast an actual unit. That's interesting. Anyway, not what we're here to talk to. Talk about. Gamescom is going on and TV Sky is not giving a crap. I do care, but I wanted to do this stream, and you have to make choices. So, Lunari Duskbringer. Again, note the use of light, that we have these highlighted areas of the character that kind of mark her out as different from the background, where everything is much more drab and much less highlighted. But there's also some interesting stuff going on with light in that the character is not fully lit. Um, they have the edge highlights, they have like the bright highlights of the sun hitting them, but much of the character is like almost permanently in shadow, especially up around the face here. Even though they're sitting in direct sunlight, they are they feel like they're barely peeking out of a shadow. Which makes sense because this is, I think, supposed to be a um an assassin of some kind. Some kind of, of like shadow blade warrior who like oh sits in the dark and, and waits for the perfect opportunity to strike. And yes, it's face paint. She she's got Lunari face tattoos. Um they have a lot of those. So yeah, that's cool. <clears throat> um, compositionally, we've also got, you can see the doorway in the background here. You have this literal frame that's being created 
to create a space for her to occupy in the center of the image. So the framing helps make her the center, central character of the image. We've got a little bit of a Dutch, like a little bit of a tilted angle. I'm gonna stop saying Dutch angles because that's a film studies term. It actually doesn't kind, kind of doesn't apply the same way to visual arts. Um, we got a little bit of a tilted angle here, which helps contribute to this sense of her being a little bit like she's sharpening her blade. She's just kind of sitting there or pouring poison on it, perhaps. Um, she's just kind of sitting there but she is intimidating. Like, this is this is a scary character, honestly. Um, this is someone like the glowing eyes staring straight at you, like no blinking. This looks like someone who's mm, like weighing up the decision about whether or not they want to kill you right now, um, which is a good attitude to have on an assassin, I think. I really like the pose too. Like it's it's got this nice kind of I'm completely chilled out right now energy, but maybe in two seconds I'm not. Which is what makes an, like, an assassin character scary. Ah, picks. <laughs> so this is, I think this is one of the first times we have um, had a close look at what picks actually looks like. Because most of the time, he's just this little dark blob with wings that's floating around Lulu. But here, apparently, he's got a tiny little round head and some actual anatomy and stuff going on, which is interesting. Now, again, color and light, color and light, color and light, color and light. Pix is marked out by uh, having a very different color than the background that he's highlighted against. He has the same color as the flowers, but the flower is all, like, down here. And compared to the background, which is all these blues, grays, all over the place, he's a much more saturated and therefore much brighter in the image. Um, there's also a little bit of, of like a compositional framing thing with like the giant eggplant monster in the background and the trees over here. And then you have this bright space here for him to occupy. It's not a, it's not much of a framing, I don't think, but it's it's slightly there. And it works really well. I really like the contrast of the pink against, like, the much colder colors in the background. That's a really nice way to compose the image. And it doesn't clash either, which I like because the lighting is is done really well to make it seem like it's part of the same current uh, location. Very cool. <laughs> uh, Braum. Braum has a quote. He has a voice quote. I think it's in Legends of Runeterra where he says, Shave mustache? Ha! When poros fly. I wonder what's going to come of that because, uh, well, Zoe may have just killed Braum's mustache. <laughs> uh, I love the poro fly. I, I'm a fan of poros in general, but like this tiny little bl butterfly poro just, yay! <laughs> Floating around the peak of Mount Targon with a million other space butterflies. It's very cool. By the way, you notice how all the butterflies are constellations? They're made of constellations of little tiny stars. Which I think is a really cool cosmic detail um, to add onto, like, to, to bring in with Zoe, especially. And I do like that they're having Zoe literally using her portal. Like, she's poking her head out of a portal and throwing this Poro out to fly. In space, no one can hear you squee. And the Poro is fully enthusiastic about it. <laughs> Not knowing how long the magic is going to last. So, golden color on Mount Targon creates the primary light source in the image. So you can see there's golden light on Zoe, there's golden light around the edges of the Poro. But then the Poro itself is much more bluish, much colder. This uh, this got the purple wings, of course, but the colors of the Poro itself, like even the color of the white, it doesn't have any white fur um, anywhere. If you took a color picker, like a color picking tool, and clicked on the image, you wouldn't find any white anywhere on the Poro at all. What you have here is various, very light shades of blues, teals, purples, um, and then, of course, around the edge where the where the fur is lit up, you have gold, um, which gives you the, se the sensation of something that is has bright white fur, but which is being lit by different kinds of light sources, but it means that the Poro has this kind of much colder teal, purple, bluish uh, color association, which is the same as the butterflies that surrounds it, uh, which is just a, a good way to indicate that it belongs more to this stuff than it belongs to, than it belongs to Tarkon. 
guess it's just a nice little illustration. It's not that much to say about it, I don't think. It's just a, a good little illustration. There's one thing. Um, you see this V-shape right here? Formed by the peak of Mount Targon and then whatever the hell this rock is. That's a little bit of framing for Zoe herself. Where she doesn't steal the focus from the Poro entirely. But there's a little bit of that lines converging on her. Um, giving her a space in the composition. And then there's this guy. So if you watched uh, the Tales of Runeterra Targon short, you'll recognize this scene. This is the Lunari girl who's running away with a Solari boy to go do kissy faces on the mountain or whatever. Um, and this is probably the prison that she was imprisoned in before she escaped, and this seems to be her jailer. And there's two, um, like, yeah, yeah, lighting color, lighting color, blah, blah, blah. We've got the framing of the grate right here that creates this, like, dark black space, essentially, for him and his bright armor to occupy. We've already talked a lot about that stuff. But then there's her. And there's two things going on with her. First of all, this hole in the grate right here. And by the way, it kind of looks like she should be able to squeeze out through one of these, so this is not a very good prison cell. Um... But the window here, this little window, creates a frame around her face. And then you have this. This sliver of light falling across her, where she's not lit up so much that she looks like she's fully out in the, in the open, but she's lit up just enough that you see, oh, there's an eye and there's a face. So because the guard is faceless, he has a mask on, when you look at the whole picture, your eye is kind of automatically, oh, face, there's a person there, this, hey. So she's kind of a secondary main character in the whole image, even though this this is the guy the card is technically about. She's a secondary character in it, which I think is very well done, uh, it's very well put together. And again, color contrast between Solari being blue, black, purple, silver, teal, colder colors. And then the bright red, shining gold, like, really ostentatious coloring of the Solari themselves as the dominant culture. And then we have Zoe fused with Talia, kind of? Like, so <laughs> a lot of people have made the connection with Zoe, um, which I think is probably somewhat accurate because she, too seems to be stepping out of a portal that looks almost identical to the ones that Zoe uses, except she has different colors in hers. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how her and Zoe fit together, but anyway. Same basic compositional tricks being used. You have this structure in the background, whatever the hell it is, creating this frame for her to occupy at the center of the image. You have this tilted angle to put you off your center. Um, and m give a slightly chaotic air to the proceedings, even though all she's doing is standing still and looking around. And then you have the use of color to mark out uh, the character herself. Like, she has this very bright shock of white hair, this white shirt. And I'm not 100% sure her... Hmm. I feel like there's some anatomy I could nitpick around the way her head is connected to her body, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the color of her paint and of the portal... And of the, the little paintings she makes. And by the way, the paintings, the, the air doodles, whatever the hell she's doing, that stuff too helps create the framing around her. Um, contrast really nicely with the blue, the teal, the gray, and then the browns and golds of the closer environment that she's in. Like, this stuff clearly looks like, oh, this, is, this has to be magic. This cannot be part of the environment. It has to be some kind of magical intrusion something something. And I do love the texture. I love the texture on the little butterflies um, and things that she's painting in the air. You have this this paintbrush texture that looks really natural, that works really well. And those textures can, can, can be kind of difficult to create, actually, under certain circumstances. There's also, again, as we talked about with the Poro, there's little constellations all over um, her artwork. You can see them kind of almost flowing out. Anywhere there's magic, there's these constellation images kind of twinkling around as well. And I like her expression. Like, she's not looking at you. She's looking up and away. She's looking at her creations. She's looking at whatever creative vision she's got going on in her head. She's not interested in whoever is observing her, which might not be anyone. But, like, it's not. she's not connecting with you, the viewer. She's connecting with what she's doing 
around her. And she has this proud pose as well. Again, like we talked about with Trundle, like one leg up and the other leg forward. And then like this like hand on the hip and like the, the paintbrush out with like the, the paint tin hanging underneath. Very proud, clearly like, yeah, I have done good work this day. Which I think works really well. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. Just joined. How is your face hole? It's holding up. It's holding up. Okay. I seem to be doing fine. Oh my god, they're so cute. They're so cute. Look at them. Look at them. Stellacorns. Look how adorable they are. Ah, <laughs> I love them. They're good. Read her text. You want to you want to read the Spacey Sketchers text? It's just a flavor text. It doesn't say anything interesting, I don't think. But anyway, this is the lady from the most recent animated short. The, and she is, for those who are confused, um, she's a Vestaya. She's not the same species as Soraka. As far as I can make out, Soraka copied the look of the Vestayan tribes that live on Targon. When she first came to Runeterra, she had to choose a mortal form, and she chose a mortal form that looks like the same tribe that this girl is from. So that's why they look similar. Um, but she's not related to Soraka directly in any way. So don't worry about it. This is a Vestaya, uh, not a Celestial. Anyway, very good dog over here. Holding her shepherd's crook thing. Uh, and then there's these adorable Stellacorns, which is so cute. Oh my god, they're so fucking adorable. My god. Um, and what's interesting about this pairing of them, and again... Same compositional tricks in terms of having a character plus a crowd that we saw with Trundle, that we saw with Diana, and that we saw with Leona. They're here, but they're not really intruding much on the space shared by the two characters themselves. They're, you have these two central characters in the image, and everyone else is kind of positioned around that. They're all orbiting it, but not intruding on the space too much, um, which helps separate these two out as the main characters of the image. And... What's interesting is that more than the girl, who is actually like the star shepherd, <clears throat> more than the girl, it's actually kind of the, the Stellacorn, the little creature that's the main character, because it's glowing so brightly it takes away the focus. Um, but they are a pairing, as you can tell, like which is just comes across in the way that they physically relate to each other. Like they're snuggling up with one another. She's hugging it, giving it cuddles, which is very cute. But but this uh, but in terms of color and, and, and lighting... The Stellacorn itself is actually kind of um, the central character. Which is just cute. It's adorable. Moving on to something very different. <clears throat> a Stygian onlooker. Which is the owl that sits here. And you probably know the drill by now. We have a framing with the trees. Um, creating this framed space. In the area. And then you have the bright light of the moon giving it this edge lighting from behind that literally highlights it in the image, and you have this big open sky as the background for it that makes it stand out and makes it um, obviously the main focus of the image. And then we have the compositional thing about how does this thing relate to this thing? How is this thing related to that guy? Well, it's standing above him, towering over him, in fact, and is looking down on him with the light of the moon backlighting it. Which, again, gives you this sense of this thing being not necessarily, like, in direct control, but it has power over him. He's sleeping, he's vulnerable, he's holding on to some treasures of some kind that maybe he's grabbed from the Shadow Isles like an idiot. <clears throat> um, but this thing is the powerful entity in the image. This one is, is awake, it's standing tall, proud, looking at this poor guy who's probably going to get killed by something absolutely terrible. And yeah, as some people have, have realized in chat, the owl has a spider face, which is a really cool creature design. Like, having an owl with the face of a spider, that sounds like... like I never thought of it before, but now that I have thought of it, it's one of the most terrifying things I've ever thought of. Absolutely terrifying. Scary as hell. Faces of the old ones. <clears throat> which seems to be a troll... Like, it's a, it's a monument to troll power of some kind. And again, we have the bright light coming out of the mouth, <clears throat> which creates a central, 
like a draw because this is the brightest thing in the entire image. Everything else, even the snowstorm, even the sky, all of it is darker. All of it is, is less luminous and less bright than the bright blue glow. Even the, the, the other troll head in the background here is much less bright than this. So this draws our attention immediately. And then you have like this, this uh, middle ground here and the foreground over here where this thing kind of pokes out like a sore thumb. It pokes out of the middle ground. It rises up and pokes into the back, like, like overlaps the background and becomes sort of a central feature. It's not a character so much um, as it is a, a landscape feature. It's more like a mountain than a character. And we get a sense of scale because we have these tiny Everosen hunters down here. Itty bitty. Little bitty ant creatures down here. Insignificant next to the majesty and the grandeur of this enormous face. And also, as people are pointing out, hand chin, I think... I'm not sure that's entirely intentional, but yeah, hand... A Thanos chin, anyway. Certainly a Thanos chin, um, which I think is cool. I also think it's cool. You can see the ropes that are being tied around here. It looks like it broke, and the trolls then kind of repaired it <laughs> and did a bad job, which I think is a, is a lovely detail. I'm going to go uh, make some tea and take a little bit of a break just to just to spare myself. So I'll be right back in a, in, in a few moments. Listen to the music in the meantime. I'm going to turn it up for you.
There we go. <sighs> I have tea, I have water, and I took a quick trip to the bathroom, because, you know. So, where were we? Right. Uh, no super chats while I was gone, right? No, good, excellent. Say hello to the dragons of Targon, um, which is a new thing. Uh, we, I mean, dragons have always been a thing in the League of Legends universe, but they haven't always looked quite like this. Oh, there's a, uh, Riku Slime Fox. Thank you for all these great and enjoyable content. Here's something for your tea break and recovery. Thank you very much. They haven't always looked quite like this. The dragons that we encounter on Summoner's Rift, um, don't really look like this. These dragons are patterned much more after Aurelian Sol. Um, whereas the dragons we're used to seeing on Summoner's Rift are patterned much more after classic Western-style dragons, these have much more of that Eastern, um, long serpentine dragon look kind of thing going on to them, which I think is interesting. Anyway, they're not the main character of the image, though. The main character of the image is this girl right here. Well, probably girl, anyway. And... There's a couple of interesting things going on compositionally. Like, we've got the slightly tilted angle again, because, well, there's giant fuck-off dragons in the picture. It's natural that you'll be a little bit off balance. But also, she's marked out by the purple magic that she's wielding, because the dragons themselves are all gray, gold, and blue, right? But she is all this reddish, purple, bright purple and gold um, on her headdress and this bright white dress as well, where there's a little bit of color affinity. Um, color contrast and color affinity, right? <clears throat> contrast makes sense, that's contrast, but affinity is the gray of her dress, like these, these gray shards, having more or less the same color as the dragons themselves. And you can use color affinity to create visual associations between different things. And so because this dress has kind of the same grayish aspect as the dragons themselves, there's a little bit of like, oh, maybe it's some kind of connection. And that's cemented a little bit further. If you look at the pattern of these gold scars, whatever the hell they are, that run down the side of the dragon's eyes, you see a similar design etched into her dress itself, which is sort of, it's not a lot, but it gives you this sense of, oh, this is there some kind of connection here? And then, of course, she's standing in the middle of a bunch of dragons and they're not eating her, so you probably figure that they've got something going on. Anyway, the mask she's wearing looks like it's mimicking... Well, probably mimicking Aurelian Sol, actually, because you have this giant... This is not her hair, I don't think, uh, necessarily, but a part of the mask, this giant purple tail, almost as long as he is, and then you have these golden horns and this bright shock of, of reddish-pink-purple much like his hair. So I think it's it's meant to associate him with the star dragon, and that's part of what gives her the power to not be eaten by these giant bastards. Um, but yeah, uh, again, lighting, doing a lot of the job of highlighting her, literally highlighting her by lighting her. And of course, she stands out from the background that she's framed against, which is the side of a giant fuck-off dragon, which works really well. Because it helps, like, the dragon becomes a compositional element that kind of creates this space over here for dragon, for the other dragons to just kind of fly around in. But we have this more grounded area over here with the dragon standing on the ground and her doing the spells that command them, maybe? Who knows? Or just announce their coming since she's the herald. Here's a great composition. I really like this one. I really like this one. Um, because there's two things going on here. First, we have uh, depth of field. Like, well, not depth of field, but we have foreshortening. You can see it's like uh, the front arm that she's got here, the the shade stalker, pokes into our space almost. Like it, it's it seems like she's reaching almost towards us as we're looking, almost as though we're climbing the wall with her as we're looking down from above. And this very nice dynamism. To the arm being like this big chunky arm anchoring her on the wall over here as the rest of her climbs. And so the arm is the anchor of the character's pose, which leads into everything else about her posture. You can see that you have, if you trace a movement line 
through, it kind of, it all kind of flows from the arm into the rest of the body. Um, which allows you to get away with something like this. This arm poking out right here with a dagger, which, if you look at it closely, it kind of doesn't wait because her shoulder is surely supposed to be over here. So how the fuck? But the foreshortening kind of hides that, um, so you can do the arm like you can do this dagger exposed, floating out in space, so that the dagger is really obvious, so that you know what it is that she's here to do. And maybe the anatomy isn't one hundred percent consistent or whatever, but it doesn't matter because the foreshortening is co is covering up for it, um, which I think works really well. And then there's compositional elements. We have this big circle down here, this Solari temple, um, with the people and stuff. That creates a vanishing point for the image. And the perspective of the image is that we're looking down from above. So we have this, like essentially it's the perspective of gravity itself that kind of pulls the eye towards the character. It's hard to explain. I'm not sure I have the words for exactly what I've got in my head right now. Because it's not it's not just a is it's not just a one point, it's a three point perspective thing. It's kind of, anyway, whatever. Forget that. That doesn't matter. I can't explain it right now. Which probably means I'm wrong. Like if I can't explain something, it probably means I'm a little bit wrong. Anyway, I love her positioning in the image. Like I love because again, remember how we talked about with Leona? <clears throat> um, and we talked about with Nocturne? being positioned over someone is visual, in terms of visual coding, in terms of visual language, it's a sign of dominance. It's a sign of power. So because she's an assassin hiding unseen in the tops and the rafters of this Solari meeting hall, whatever, she has power over these little tiny creatures. Like, they're tiny little ants scurrying around on the ground. You can see this Solari high priest with his fancy robes and his staff and whatever. Ha! Ah. This is the person who has the power in this image. The direction of natural force pulls her towards her goal. Yeah, that that might be a way to put it, extremely delicious muffin. That might be the thing I was kind of kind of searching for. Um, but yeah, you can see this is the center of her attention as well. She's not looking at us, the viewers. She's looking at her targets down below. Look at this good boy. Oh yeah, this absolute unit. <laughs> So, um, there's a few creatures like this, which are gem creatures, um, which create gems in hand, which is associated, of course, with Taric. And this is the first one of them, and the cheapest. <clears throat> and it's just, like, not much to say. You have this outcropping of rock here. They stand upon it. They're highlighted by the lighting itself. Makes them the central characters. This is a nature painting. Um, it's... It's very reminiscent. If you look, if you go to a museum, a local hist uh, art history museum that you may have, um, and you find nature paintings from the Romantic period especially, you'll get stuff like this. It's so, like, this is very much in the style of, like, classical nature painting uh, in a lot of ways, which is uh, not much to say that we haven't said a million times on the stream already before, but it's a nice little picture of some nice goats with some cool horns. So, action scene once again. Look at the waterline. We have a slight tilted angle. Not, not as extreme as it has been in other pictures, but a slight tilted angle. As uh, these two absolute chads are going at it with each other. One thing I appreciate about um, this Solari warrior's character design is that she's a woman. But unlike Leona, she doesn't have a stupid fucking boob plate on. Like, this, the, the character design isn't going out of its way to say, Hey! Hey! It's a girl! It's a woman! Hey! Tits! Hey! Hey! Lady! Like, that's... And that's the feeling I always get um, when we're dealing with Leona. When we're dealing with, like, female fantasy armor and character design, where, like, they're wearing boob plates or, like, chainmail bikinis, or they have some kind of, like, they these little things that e e emphasize their hips and accent their their female curves and stuff. For me, it always just feels kind of try-hard. Like, it always feels like it's like, no, 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 she's sexy, she's hot, she's totally, you definitely want to bang her, she's cool, she's a woman, she's got breasts, she's got hips, uh, please like her, please like... It feels like that to me a lot of the time. It, it feels like really kind of needy, um, in a really off-putting kind of way. I appreciate it a lot more when it looks like, no, she's wearing, like, 
warrior clothes. She's a warrior who's wearing warrior clothes because she's a warrior. And then she's also still hot. Like, you look at, like, boy, as a well-cut piece of lady meat right there. It's, it's a hot lady, but it's not desperately trying to get you to find her hot. It just creates a hot character and trusts you to understand that, yeah, this character is hot. So, uh, compositional elements. We have the shield in the middle. And this is a Shlauri shield bearer, so it makes like this makes sense that the shield is a major compositional um, element. It's almost as big as she is, basically. Um, but it also creates a literal like in the same way that it's a barrier for her in combat to protect her against the Solari assailant. It also creates a compositional barrier and essentially splits the image in two between the Solari side over here and the Lunari side over here, and you can see that in the colors as well. <clears throat> Over here, golden sunlight, sunset, illuminating her, creating these bright golden highlights off the side of her armor. Over here, though, shadow. A little bit more darkness, a little slightly colder colors, a little bit more blue, a little bit more gray, a little bit less saturated, which is where the Solari lives. So even in the image itself, the color, storytelling of the color, gives you this two sides fighting against each other in narrative baked into the scene itself in the background. Um, and then there's just the posing. The posing is really good. Like, she's got a really strong line of action here. Like, you can practically draw a curve, like, all the way up around and out here. From, because she's thrusting the shield forward and protecting herself. And you can see the Solari, uh, the Nari Warrior has the same thing, where you get this wonderful curve through her, like, this way. Which is very impractical. Like, you probably shouldn't move like that if you're actually fighting, but it looks cool, and rule of cool tends to trump things, uh, trump logic in these kinds of things. Same thing with, with the, the Solari spear. is like, if you're fighting with a shield against an enemy, your spear shouldn't be all the way back here. It should be poking out in front of the shield. That's where it's supposed to be. Um, but again, this is a cool pose. It makes it much more dynamic and interesting. Because, like, otherwise, if she was just kind of turtling behind a shield and poking with a spear, which is what you're supposed to actually do, that wouldn't look cool. Like, that would just look like she's being a coward in Dark Souls or something. <laughs> then there's this fucking monstrosity. Like, hella Barney the Dinosaur vibes out of this one. What are you? Why do you look like that? Jesus Christ. It's cute, don't get me wrong. It's just, why does it have fur around its eyes? I don't like that. That's wrong. Anyway, flavor text comes from Zoe. I'm not going to attempt to do her voice. But basically, she's created a portal. She's found this space creature. And she's punching it through the portal whether it wants to go or not. <laughs> Poor thing. It's animal abuse is what it is. Um, <clears throat> which, is very, which is very mean of her. But then Zoe is a sociopath. Whew, that tea's hot. Um, what I like most about this picture is the expressiveness of it. First of all, the expressions of the stomper, who's clearly not happy to be there. He just wants to go home. Look at him. He's <laughs> like, oh, no, I don't want to be here. This is scary. There's people. I don't know. Like, poor thing. But then look at the expressions of the characters in the background. <laughs> like, these are great. And the crow in the foreground. Or the, uh, maybe not a crow. Maybe it's like a magpie. I don't know. Excellent expressions on the characters, and you get this sense of, <clears throat> like, suddenly erupting chaos. <clears throat> um, which, which, with, like, where you can see, like, characters on either side are falling over because this thing has suddenly shown up in the middle of everything. Apples are falling out of the basket and fruit um, on the man's back. You have this character who's, like, like, practically bending herself backwards, trying to see what the hell is going on. And you have these lopsided portals facing every which way, which creates this very chaotic scene. But there's also stillness. Um, the stillness being the circle on the ground, the circle of the portals themselves, creating this, this little sort of triangular, almost, space in the middle. And you can see even the framing being done by the civilians that the poor thing is trampling creating this central area for the poor stomper to occupy. And it's also, again, highlighted by the light, and there's lots of... Uh, pretty much every third Legends of Runeterra card takes place during the golden hour of the day, like 5 p.m. when the sun is not going down yet, but you got the <clears throat> beautiful golden light. 
So that works really well. And then the color scheme, of course. All the characters, all the actual characters in the scene. I've got reds, we've got browns, we've got this sort of light uh, powder blue-ish on the latest coat, but it's all washed out because she's in the background. All of that contrasts really well with the bright purple and the sparkles and the very weird colors of like the fur and the wings and the blue of the skin of the thing. Like it looks like it's out of place even from a color perspective in this environment that's full of browns and grays and reds uh, otherwise. <laughs> Is tea drinkable yet? Ah, whew, just barely, just barely. Ah. So, <clears throat> as we talked about a million times, lighting, he's literally highlighted in the image. Color, he's more colorful than pretty much all of the other trolls in the image. And composition. We've got the troll, this these trolls back here, and this troll right here, creating sort of this, this space in the middle of the picture for him to occupy, which is like, it works really well. It's many of the same concepts and ideas um, that we've already talked about. Then there's the little bit of highlighting on the thing here. And I'm not sure what that is, because to me, this kind of looks like an Aurelian soul head, like a tiny little, like with the skull down here and then the the crown and thing like it kind of looks like it like that which is weird i don't know uh, but it's clearly the thing that this sc troll scavenger is scavenging some golden trinket or something from something that they've killed i guess uh so i don't know about that but there is a little bit of golden highlight like you can see this little golden glow just around the tip of the thing which helps like draws our attention to the troll first and then oh the thing that he's looking at the thing that he's holding up which is interesting and again the troll character designs there's this variety that I appreciate. Like, they're all, like, built like brick shit houses, obviously. But this guy has a little bit more of a wiry aesthetic. Like, he's a little bit more skinny around the waist. He's got this, like, hourglass shape thing going on. Whereas this guy is practically a box on legs, right? Like, it's... Like, just bump, bump, bump. That's all that is. I should not make noises with my mouth right now. That hurts, actually. Ouch. Ow. Oh, just a sec. Ow. Fucking hell. Okay, no sound effects. Sound effects are banned. They hurt. But like I said, there's a variety, like with the broken tusk on the one guy. And like this guy has bolts around his for whatever reason. And this guy has this long, very pointy nose. And this guy has this stubby tomato nose. Like there's little things that just like, oh, the, the character designers actually took time to imagine these guys having different physical traits, even within their species. And now, and it's appropriate that it's uh, Talia's theme playing, now we get to Tiari the Traveler. So, according to Riot themselves, Tiari, which is the guy right here, um, at this point in his journey, identifies as a non-binary, uh, ass assigned male at birth non-binary person, and uses he-they pronouns. Uh, which is like, it's not really something that you can see in the artwork, necessarily. Like, in the artwork, you would be forgiven for mis misidentifying them as a, as a cis male, but they are, in fact, a non-binary uh, AMAB, as the terminology goes, which is very cool. And we'll see how that shakes out as we get further down the cards, because as the card cost goes up, much like with Sithria, how like she arrives in tar in in, um, in Demacia in one card, and then in another card you kind of see her being a trainee, and then eventually she becomes Sithria the Bold, this war leader of Demacia. You get this storyline playing out over the course of the cards. Tiari's journey up Mount Targon plays out across the cards as well. You may remember a while ago now, back when we looked at the Gift Giver, who is... Where the hell are they? There. Tiari is here. This is where they are beginning their journey with the, their companions to travel up the mountain. And then the actual card of Tiari themselves is here. As they are traveling up the mountain, Tiari is using his magic um, to keep his companions safe. And here again, I think this lady is supposed to be Noxian. And I think this dude over here is supposed to be Demacian. 
Tiari themselves, I think, uh, are probably Targonian. Not 100% sure. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. And yeah, uh, again, the composition. This is a very obvious frame. Like, you can literally see Tiari is creating the frame uh, for himself to be in. With, like, the golden glow of protective magic thing around them. But there's also a secondary framing with, like, the, the cliff facing on the foreground that kind of emphasizes, that kind of supports the framing that's going on right here. And then there's the purple light, which makes them stand out from uh, the blue background. And Tiari themselves um, are highlighted in the center of the image as such, whereas uh, his companions are somewhat more drab in the image. And they've got some edge highlights and things going on. Makes it much more obvious that way. And here we get, like, another one of Zoe's companions. Like, uh, every champion in the game has a set of characters that are, like, directly associated with them. And y the young witch here is either associated with Zoe or more perhaps more likely with Lulu. Or perhaps both, because Zoe and Lulu know each other, actually. They're friends. Uh, they have a lot of voice lines with each other in the game. <laughs> and it turns out they meet a lot, and they hang out, and they do stuff together. So that's fun. But I think, uh, yeah, it's probably a, a glade witch of some, uh, of some kind. And again, the composition is, pre is pretty obvious here. You got these dark plants in the foreground, but then you got this brightly lit space right here with the plants, a little bit of sky behind our main character, so her space isn't crowded. Um, and like the whole composition serves to highlight her as the main character. And then you have like details out on the sides that are less emphasized, but there's also a little bit of, uh, this is something I don't like very much actually. It's a it's something I wish that visual artists would do less, which is the motion blur um, that's going on here, which is essentially a radial blur a little bit, I think. Yeah, Gaussian. Maybe a Gaussian blur with like a central vanishing point. I don't know. Um, something going on, like where they're blurring out most of the image to create a sense of speed and movement that she's like speeding through the image. And since she's the only thing that's clear in the image, it's essentially mimicking what would happen with a camera where a camera would focus on a main subject but put everything that's not in the focus out of focus. And it works. It's just, for me, I always kind of... I get annoyed with, like, these digital filter effects just because there are ways to create an effect like that by drawing it by hand. It's a lot more work, but I really like it because it looks cooler. I think it looks better. But that's just, just my nitpick. It's not really a quality thing. It's just a personal preference kind of thing. Grumble, grumble, old man yells at card game. So here's something very cool. Um, these Crescent Guardians are, I think, some sort of Solari magical construct. Like, they're, they're guard Solari temples or something along those lines. Uh, I just really like their character design. I like, like, they have this crescent moon that comes into this body. Like, wow, it's just a really cool monster design. Like, they look, they look really cool. Oh, uh, there was a super chat I missed. Juggernugget. Hey, TV Sky, and I really like your streams, and I love your videos. Keep on the good work and stay safe. Greetings from Germany. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. I just like... These are real... I like to fight these monsters in Dark Souls. Like, they look like really cool Dark Souls monsters. Oh, sorry. Did I say Solari? I meant Lunari. Doi. I meant Lunari. <clears throat> and there's a lo lovely color thing going on here, too, because for some reason, despite being a Lunari construct, they're draped in these bright red... Um, bandages, I guess, sort of, whatever, uh, which is a little weird for the Lunari because the Lunari are all about blue and purple and silver and sorry, but you have this bright red on them. It creates a good contrast, though. Um, it creates a, a a nice contrast with the character that makes them look a little bit weird, uh, because I think without these um, cloth coverings, they look a little bit less intimidating they'd look a little bit less scary. They'd look a little bit less weird. But when you have these coverings, like, because clothes are a sign of civilization. Clothes are a sign of intelligence. Um, if your screen is black, you should refresh the stream. That sounds like a YouTube bug. Um, but having these clothes put on them makes them feel like, oh, are they intelligent? Like, are they... Are, can, can they think? Can they reason? Are they people? 
or are they just mindless constructs? It creates this little sense of, oh, they're wearing clothes like a person, but they're clearly not a person. That is unpleasant. That's, that's off-putting and weird, which I quite like. Doggy. Look at the pupper with his tentacles coming out of his face. Oh, you adorable little thing. Hi, pupper. Are you playing with a nice man? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, once again, tilted angle on the camera because big scary monster murdering a guy. That's the kind of thing that you might want to tilt an angle on. And then there's some interesting stuff going on with the colors, but mostly I like the, the posture and composition. Remember how we've talked multiple times about how to create an image where it's obvious that one character is dominant over another? Yeah, this is another example of that, where you have his its victim on the ground, lying down, clearly pretty frickin' dead at this point. And then you have this thing, like, looming over, dominating, literally stepping on the possessions of this thing, controlling the space, owning it. Like, even if this guy was, like, sitting up, or standing, even, so long as you have this composition where this thing looms so large in the image and takes up so much of the space, it is dominant, and it is powerful. <laughs> ah, T. Yes, there's a bit of Cthulhu going on in here. And that comes down to the colors, where I'm interested, because, as we've established previously, this purple, this purplish-red thing, that's not normal for the Shadow Isles, which is where these cards seem to be taking place. Uh, this is one of Nocturne's followers. This purple marks out Nocturne Association. It marks out the association with Nocturne's nightmares, with the demonic. Um, but then there's the tentacles, and they have Shadow Isles colors. <clears throat> they are blue and they're teal and they are ghostly in the same way that a lot of Shadow Isles cards are. And what it is draining out of the guy is clearly also his soul. Like, it's it has that soul ghost color that's associated with the Shadow Isles. <clears throat> has Nocturne been integrated with the Shadow Isles in lore? No, 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 no. He's not a, he's not a Shadow Isles character. He's not a Shadow Isles character at all. Um, he's just a demon who happens... I think he happens to be in the Shadow Isles. Like, he spends a lot of time there. But he's not a ghost. He's not a, a Black Mist champion. He's a demon. Same as Fiddlesticks. See, I'm, I'm curious about that. Like, the lore behind... Like, is this like a demonic interaction with the Shadow Isles? Where they can do Shadow Isles stuff or something? I don't know. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, scary doggo. And the guy had a stick of dynamite too, which I like that he was clearly trying to blow the thing up, but uh, didn't get that far. Which creates a bit of a sub-narrative, by the way. Because uh, a lot of the Nocturne cards... Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I think the dead guy... Might be this dude. And it's hard to tell, because he's so freaking small in this picture, but... Um... In the same way that, where the hell's the Stygian Watcher? Like, I don't think it's this guy. Because uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure, because like it seemed to me that maybe they were trying to do a thing where these people are being hunted by Nocturne, and then the various Nocturne-associated cards, you see what happens to them. And I think maybe that guy... is supposed to be this guy? Maybe? It's because they're so small, it's kind of hard to tell. And, I, like, maybe this more slender guy is supposed to be this guy? Not sure. <clears throat> anyway, look at this adorable thing! Look how cute this thing is. I love him. He's good. Very good friend. Uh, was there another card associated with it? No. But, yeah, here, again, the framing is eminently obvious. You can literally see concentric circles... Um, expanding out into creating this crater, and the crater itself becomes a kind of frame for the Stellacorn to occupy, as more of its fellow Stellacorns are landing around the place. 
But yeah, Stellacorns are powerful. Like, if you look at the animated short, one Stellacorn falling down to Earth, like, blasted through a mountain. So, like, they're f probably functionally indestructible, really. But yeah, again, like, here, very simply, you don't have to highlight the character if the character is already glowing. And the glow of the character has a different um, color qual quality, a different kind of, uh, of much more brighter shades of blue rather than the very drab environments that he's surrounded by. So that all highlights him, them, it, who knows. Here's another of Zoe's followers. And the thing about her is that she looks kind of like she's this lady's twin, doesn't she? Like, this is white hair and brown hair, but they have practically the same exact face, which could be just Riot, like, same face syndrome as usual. But I can't help but feel that they might be related to each other, like they might be two sisters, one of them associated with Zoe and then the other one with, with Lulu. Something along those lines. Um, but by the way, I, I don't know if there's any connection there, but that was just because they're drawn by the same person, perhaps. Anyway... Framing once again, you can see the face of the character has this little background frame, moonlight in the background. The character themselves are very different color shades than most of the environment. You have this bright, pur these saturated purples, the bright pinks. You've got the uh, tanned brown of the skin, uh, as contrasted with the darkness of the of the general environment. And then again, you have all the little constellation effects and star sparkles going on in the magic that they are casting. And it's a perfectly cute, adorable little piece of artwork. And again, highlighting the character, making the environment much more shaded to compensate. And then we have this lady. Who I'm a little bit... Her skin is is not blue, I don't think. Like, I think she's wearing... Okay, I'm not sure how to parse her, if it's body paint or whatever the hell it is. Because she's got hands that seem to be like a normal skin shade color but then you get up here and it's just like she's all blue and with white eyes and things maybe it's magic who knows i don't know um but if i'm not much mistaken these plants are the ones that aphelios uses to create the poison that he takes before he goes into combat i think it seems to me it looks kind of similar to it um but yeah, it's probably some kind of body paint for a ritual or whatever. But again, we have the circular pool creating a frame, like a creating a, a space for her to occupy. We have other characters in the scene, but they are de-emphasized. Their faces are not shown and they are not highlighted. And you have the literal shaft of light coming down from above to illuminate her, which puts her at the center of the image. Um, and also note that nothing overlaps her, like which is which is another thing is that background characters in the image, like this priest guy over here, he's overlapped, and this guy's overlapped by, like, features in the image. And the same thing goes for... Let's see, where was another crowd scene? Here. Here, again, and the same thing goes for, like, characters in the background, you can see they're constantly being overlapped by things. Things are constantly standing in front of them, standing in the way of them, uh, like, covering out a little bit of their body, but the central character, Leona... Nothing overlaps her in the image, which again helps center, like, mark her out and center her. So imagine if instead of this, like, if part of this arc right here had, like, cut across her midriff here, that would kind of be like, wait, hang on, uh, that would that'd be weird. He, she wouldn't really be the central character if there was something in the way. You wouldn't do that in a movie. Um, let something get in the way of the character you're trying to film. Um, so that's another compositional thing in terms of how to compose an image. Anyway, here's a magic space yordle who lives on Targon and controls gems, which is cool. Um, and we get two names, Emir and Haley, Mountain Sojourners. This is Tiari again. They are getting advice, support, a test from Targon Yoda over here of some kind. Uh, so that's a continuation of Tiari's story as he's climbing up Mount Targon. And again, very obvious composition going on here. Like, he's literally in the center of a circle, right in the middle of the image. But again, note the use of camera angle. Um, oh yeah, Emir and Haley are Tiari's companions. They're the two people that, that uh, he's traveling with. Again, the choice of angle. We are 
even lower than Tiari themselves, actually. We are lower down in the steps than they are, but this thing hovers above all of us. It hovers above our eye line, which is like somewhere down here. It hovers above our eye line. It hovers above Tiari. It is powerful. It has control over these gems. It is centered in the image. It is highlighted by the light and it is in control. It has power. Whereas Tiari is more of a passive um, observer and we are even lower on the hierarchy than the two of them. So, again, remember how I said that Leona and Diana have a lot of joint storytelling going on between their images? Same thing for the Sulari and Lunari priestesses. They kneel, both of them, in these circles, surrounded by the faithful and illuminated by light from, from above. The same exact thing is happening here. You have this Solari priestess kneeling in a circle with a light shaft coming down from above, illuminating them as they are surrounded by other onlookers. It's like it's exactly the same scene with just a few aesthetic changes from one to the other um, in order to um, in order to differentiate them. But it, it emphasizes again that the Solari and Lunari are not that different really, that their differences are probably more in their heads than in their actual spiritual practice. Um, which just seems to be where Riot is going with the story, is that the Lunari and the Solari have to stop fighting and work together in order to prevent some kind of world catastrophe of some kind. Which is cool. Ah, good team. You know what else is cool? Those fucking arms? Isn't that nice? Like, holy shit, a lady who looks like she can actually lift the thing she's lifting above her head. That's a heavy-ass motherfucking scepter. She has the guns to lift it. She's got the midriff. She's got the muscle to lift it. And this, by the way, I wish Leona had a chest plate like this. Like, yes, there's boobs on it. That's whatever. Okay, fine, I guess. But couldn't she have one of these that looks like it would actually protect her a little bit? Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, well. And contrast the Solari pri Priestess, by the way, with the Lunari. <laughs> we can see who spends more time in the gym. <clears throat> but yeah, excellent. And again, Legends and Terra has so much more diversity of character design than, Le uh, than uh, League of Legends does. Why is a priest so jacked? She should be on the battlefield destroying armored people with her bare hands. Yeah, she's a Solari Priestess. Um, she's a warrior. Sendu, Tek Sendu, however I pronounce that. That's why she's jacked. It's because she is a warrior priestess, but the Solari priestess is not a warrior. She's not a fighter. She's a <clears throat> she's a spiritual leader, which again is a difference between the Solari and the Lunari, is that the Lunari are a warrior culture. <clears throat> Whereas the Solari are much more of a scholar culture, as far as I can tell. Oh my god, it's a cake! No! We have been bamboozled once again! It's a cake! Anyway, tasty fey folk. And here is its nutritional information. <laughs> it's low in fat, so it's probably healthy. I mixed the names up again. Yeah, I know, I know. Lunari, Solari, blah, blah. They're the same. They're the same. There's no difference. <sighs> <laughs> anyway, this is just cute. Like, I, I like these little fucking... Isn't this a McDonald's mascot? Isn't there one that looks pretty much exactly like this? I don't know. Um, but it's just... They're just uh, fall guys, basically. They're very cute. Eggplant creatures. Um, but again, you can see the foreground created by this right here puts the character out in front and gives him a space to occupy that he dominates, that's only his. No other characters are in this space with him, in this depth of the image with him. He's also more saturated. He's also um, darker. Like, he's got more contrast going on than the characters in the background. They're all washed out by the light, by the, like, the magical light that suffuses whatever the hell it is that they live in. Whereas he has much more um, saturated and full colors than they do, which again helps mark him out by contrast. And then we have this framing where these characters are also separated from him a little bit by the fact that he is on this mound, this raised bit, and they're all sort of clustered together in the background much more than he is.
Then we have this buff motherfucker. The furries are eating well um, with this particular update to Legends of Runeterra. They are they are getting their money's worth. Um, I, this guy is a Vestaya, I believe. Uh, one of the same tribe as the herder lady that we saw earlier. And one thing one of the writers at Riot pointed out to me is that much like how um, like Vestaya can run the gamut, they can be like Rengar, which is like full furry. And then they can be like Saya and Rakan, which is like mostly humans in cosplay. And so this guy is apparently a more Vestaya-ish member of the same tribe as the girl, the Star Shepherd girl. Like they're from the same tribe, but one of them is more Vestaya magical-ish than the other. Which is a kind of thing that like, I think it's fine as a design idea. But it's really boring when it's used to create, like, false sexual dimorphism, where all the lady members of the species just look like hot girls, and all the male members of the species look like cool badass monsters. Uh, which is something that League of Legends is kind of guilty of doing. A lot. Many times, I really wish they'd fucking stop. I really wish they would allow ladies to be monstrous. And don't bring up, um... The Rek'Sai with me on this one, because Rek'Sai isn't a person. She's not a woman. She's a monster. She is a, actually, she's a void beast, not a humanoid character. Where do you get your insider riot info? I just ask rioters. You can just ask them on Twitter. Did you know that? You can just talk to them. They're there. They're happy to answer most things you say. <laughs> or, I mean, it probably helps that I have 10,000 followers and I make videos about their product. That probably makes them answer me more than most people, but you, you can just talk to them. <laughs> anyway, uh, this guy. Again, composition. The falling log that he's holding up helps create a space along with, like, the background. Like, you can see, it kind of, you can kind of draw a line down here across the horns of the goat. Down here, around there, and then follow that back up across the tree trunk, down the branch here, and... That's his window. That's the that's the space in the image he's supposed to be in. Um, the KDA song is out. Yes, I know. We watched it together on the stream earlier. Um, that creates a space. And interestingly, he's not highlighted. Like, unlike many, many, many of the other characters we've talked about, this guy is not highlighted, but the branch, like the, the tree trunk he's holding up is... It's highlighted with very bright light, which draws our attention to it. And then there's him. And then most of the, the job of centering him as the main character is done by the framing and the background. It, by having this window for him to occupy with the light around him being used to draw our attention like generally towards him, even if he's not necessarily himself highlighted. He has a tail. Yes, he does. He has a long, fluffy tail, too. There's going to be some thirsty furries about this card, I swear to God. Then there's the Fey Guide. And Lulu shows up here again, looking better than she does in her own cards uh, a little bit, which is partly down to the angle. Um, again, Yordle Anatomy is hard. It's, it's a difficult fucking thing to get right because they are tiny, tiny characters with enormous heads and they don't make any goddamn sense anatomically. So... If from certain ang like they just don't work from certain angles. From certain angles, you have a really hard job drawing them in a way um, that like that makes them look useful and believable. And Lulu's um, main art is a bit of a victim of that, at least in part. Whereas down here with the Fey Guide, hey, we're getting a slight more from the top down look at her, which hides some of the awkwardness with the neck and how that fits into the giant head and. Uh, so like, that works together pretty well. But she's not the main character of this image. He is. <laughs> it's emo. <laughs> oh my god. That's his name now. He's emo. <laughs> oh, that's good. Anyway, again, he's highlighted by the light that he's literally carrying in a jar in front of him. Um, we've got the framing device of... Or the, fr the compositional framing with the log going up over them, coming down here. And that's the thing about, like, most um, most of the cards um, in Legends of Runeterra. Even though you have all this big, giant space, in most cards in Legends of Runeterra, only a very small amount of the space actually contains relevant stuff. 
Um, most of the most of the space tends to be filled up with like pretty inconsequential background nonsense. Which again is a compositional thing to remember. This is something to learn from is that if you are drawing a big fancy fantasy illustration, this stuff, it doesn't have, no, you don't have to fill up the image. All of this nonsense out, it doesn't have to matter. It just has to be, take up space. It just has to, has to create an environment. But this is the stuff that matters. So it's easy to get intimidated as an artist when you see these giant fantasy illustrations of various things. Um, and go, oh god, I have to paint, oh, is it? but like, no, you can actually skimp out on this a lot. Like, the characters in the backgrounds, the environments, they are never nearly as detailed as the central characters in the image, which is something, you can't really see it on stream here, unfortunately, because I uh, can't show it to you, but if you have, if you take a look at this art, if you can find a really big source file, if they post like a really large size, high quality version of the image, and then you zoom in on like the priests down here, you'll find that they're not really that well drawn. Really. Like, they're not really that well drawn. They are just smears of color that are put down pretty quickly and then cleaned up a little bit with basically just a flat brush. They're just kind of like mashed on there. Not that much time and attention goes into all of the unimportant details of the image. All the time and attention and the production time of this image has been focused around the central character, maybe the point of focus, and that's it. Um, and that's that's something that uh, commercial artists in this space learn to do very quickly, is prioritize where does your effort go? Like, what are you spending time detailing? What are you spending time creating? What are you spending time putting work and attention into and most of the time is like a lot of the image you can kind of half-ass like you don't need to go all out creating the most amazing details and the background stuff doesn't matter so long as the characters look good you're 90 percent of the way there ah <sighs> this is cute He's tucking them in. And then he's going to eat them alive later. But he's tucking them in. Um, I, I, I quite like the composition of this image. It looks so peaceful, doesn't it? Quiet, nice, gentle. This is a nice fella. <laughs> it's like he's tucking in these guys, right? They're sleeping there, having a good time. But look at the ones he's got in his backpack. They're like, oh, God, help us. He's going to eat us. No, I'm too young to die. <laughs> and one of them has a fucking pacifier. <laughs> He's eating children. Children. Soylent Green is people. Uh, anyway, many of the same elements we've talked about before. The background here is washed out uh, with light. Like it's it's basically misty, misted all over. The character himself is edge lighted and highlighted in the frame. You've got the character himself here being used, actually, to create a foreground for him and the other little eggplants um, to occupy. As you say, much the same stuff we've talked about many times before. I do like that it's his hair, like his basket that he's carrying the little eggplants in is basically, he's just, he's just knitted his hair into a basket for his victims, which is a very clever little thing to do. Now again, Tiari and his companions getting sage advice from an old wizard man who is showing them constellations and stuff, I guess. Uh, he's a mountain scryer. He's a future teller kind of character person. And again, the scryer is separated out from the other character. Like, Tiari overlaps Emil. Emmet, whatever the hell the guy's, guy was. Tiari's face is looking away from us. We can see Emmet's face, but he's being overlapped by Tiari. And then we have uh, the lady, can't remember her name. She's like kind of tucked away down here in the corner. Most of her body is cut off. But this guy gets to be essentially a full body Gandalf character standing in the center of everything, surrounded by these magical lines of things to which he's connected with his staff which creates a, like a, a nice center of the image for him to occupy. Which again, just perfectly good composition. And I think, again, we, we're looking at a tilted angle that's being used to kind of cheat um, and get more <clears throat> and get more of the space um, to show up. Like to, to give us more of a look on 
the magic that the guy is conjuring above his head. Whereas if we had a completely right angle, then a lot of that stuff would be kind of cut off at the top unless we really lowered the angle way more. Oh, uh, it should be weird. And then we have the guy who was for like five minutes on Twitter, everybody's new boyfriend for a moment. I think they were kidding. I think they were kidding. Oh, it's a claw gauntlet. It's a gauntlet. It's not her. She doesn't have claws. It's a it's a glove that she's wearing. She's an Oxian. Um, but yeah, the, the furries were happy, I guess. <laughs> they, they were given a Bara boyfriend to thirst over. A uh, swole squirrel here, presumably being affected by Lulu's magic to make him bigger. Some such nonsense along those lines. Again, the trees in the background create this little triangular sort of wedge shape for him to occupy, as well as like just the, the swirl of the magic, all of that highlighting him in the center of the image. He's also the biggest character in the entire image, full stop, as he seems to be stealing this squirrel's girlfriend. Look at that. Like, this this guy's like, no, don't steal my girlfriend. And she's like, oh, my God, I want to chomp on his dick. Uh, which, you know, good for her, I guess. Like, a little bit of infidelity. Well, I was about to say never hurt anyone, but it actually hurts a lot of people, so don't do that. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. I, it, as usual with, with the stream, like, I kind of run out of things to say after a while because the same compositional trick, like, the same basics are used everywhere. Uh, to make the things work. But one thing I will note about the squirrels here is look at the color um, uh, temperature um, of, of the image. Look at the uh, like the, the purple of this buff squirrel's fur. It's really not that dissimilar to his environment. Like he looks much more like he fits in his environment, like he's a part of it, than, for example, here where like the, the mountain scryer is highlighted by these bright, like really warm red yellow colors against the blue of the sky in the background that like that sets him apart from the environment the squirrel on the other hand looks much more like he's a part of it because the color coding makes him more of a part of it and someone says in chat the swirl covers the bulge yeah <laughs> uh. So, Troll Ravager. This one's a little different. Um, like, the same basic stuff, he's literally highlighted with light, you know what I'm saying? But there's also, he's creating the frame for himself. Like, we've got the building he's about to smash on the one hand, but then he, the battering ram that he's holding creates, like, this center frame in the image that he can occupy. And again, some, like some diversity in the trolls character designs that are like this guy has a very different nose he's got a lot more wrinkles he's got a different look than a lot of the other trolls in the game he's got these giant chompers too which are very cool but outside of that is it that much to say like well, no but notice how the the depth in the image the artist is making depth in the image by using light oh it's a she oh yeah it's a she oh that's cool uh, this is Hagar, apparently. Didn't even realize. Apologies for that. That's very cool. Uh, you know what? I, I appreciate that. Remember how we talked previously about how, um, a lot of the time, there's this fake sexual dimorphism thing that goes on in monster designs, where, like, every time a monster character is a female, all of a sudden they have makeup and tits, and they look really, like, they look sexy in a human way. Here we have a monster girl who actually looks like a monster, to the point where I didn't even realize. I appreciate that. That's good. There should be more diversity like that. Ooh. Sorry, Hermes uh, Navarro Garcia. Bye. I appreciate that. That's cool. Excellent. Oh, that's not a beard. I thought it was a beard. It's not a beard. It's sideburns. Oh, it's her, it's it's her hair. That's why I was confused. Well, part of the reason. Here's another cool composition. Um. <clears throat> so the cliff that the dragon is resting on, it creates a space, like it creates a separation between the dragon and the kids. So when the kid is leaping up for the flame on the dragon's tail, which he probably shouldn't touch, or she probably shouldn't touch, um, 
you don't get the sense that they are in the same space as the dragon. Like, they're not standing right next to it. You don't get the sense that they are, like, immediately in danger from it. Like, if this thing turns around, it's going to see them and eat them. You get this, this, this little bit of visual separation that makes the scene a peaceful one. And a happy one. And a funny one. Like, where the kid trying to go for the dragon's tail and the older kid going, No, what the fuck are you doing? No, don't do that. Um... Which would be different if they were, like, completely in the same space with the dragon. You'd be going, oh, oh, is that a good idea? Oh, god, it's gonna kill them. But no, because there is this little visual barrier between them, you get a different mood in the in the image. And remember what I talked about in terms of, like, where does an artist put their effort? In terms of, like, it can, illustrations like this can look intimidating, but once you get up close, you get to see all the corners that the artist is cutting. Well, you can see that here. You can see that the kids, even though they're characters in the image, are much, much less detailed. Like, there's much less, like, fine detail work has gone into them than has gone into the dragon. All the fine detail work, all of all of the effort is up here with the dragon himself, with the mountainsides, with the scales on his back. That's where all the detail work goes. And over here, we're just painting a little bit more fast and loose, and it's fine. It looks good. Gotta remove someone else from chat. There we go. Um, and again, framing. We have the bright light of the sunset over here, drawing our attention to the dragon's head itself. We have the mountains and the cliff forming this frame for the dragon's head to occupy, and that's what centers it as the, as the main character in the image. And again, very cool Chimera character. Remember how the owl um, was a mix between like an owl and then it had a spider face? Here's a horse with two heads, too many legs, and fucking bat wings. That is badass as shit. That is, like, that's, that is a cool monster design, right? That's really fucking cool monster design right there. I really like this. I really like it. It's just a cool character. But again, I'm not... It, you can see... Look at this guy. He has the dynamite, right? And he's got the pickaxe. I think this guy is definitely the same guy as the Doom Beast. Like, it's this guy because of the dynamite and the things. I'm, I'm reasonably sure. So I think there's some kind of through line with no, the with, uh, um, Nocturne's characters. Like, with the, with the characters in Nocturne's image. That it's supposed to be telling some kind of story about them. Like, like that the... Dusk Rider found the guy and scared him away, and then the Doom Beast killed him. Something along those lines. Um, so that's cool. Uh, but outside of that, we were talking previously about framing, about how you frame someone as dominant. Well, you get that right here again. It's T posing on him, like which is to say, it's spreading out its wings, it's taking up space, and that's one way to make a character dominant in a picture is to just have them take up more space, like give more of the space of the image to their body, to their character design. Whereas this guy is little bitty tiny dude, itty bitty, being towered over by this giant monster. Um, which I think is cool. And again, we have this red glow and this like this redness to the monster that makes it look like it's not a Shadow Isles beast. Because Shadow Isles monsters, like all the ghosts, tend to be blue and teal and purple. Uh, blue and teal and gray, rather. Then we have this cool fucking dragon. This is a very cool dragon design. I don't even know if it's a dragon, really, but I think it is. Um, fused Firebrand, whatever the hell that means. This, is a, again, is a very, very cool monster. Just because you have this, this combination of... Um, oh, I wish Nocturne looked as good as his followers. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, my heart. I agree. <clears throat> it is a cool monster design because you have the bulk and, like, the furriness of the thing, but then it's also this long, slender thing with these, like, pointy claw things going on. This nice visual contrast in the thing. That just makes it look like a cool-ass fucking monster. But the other thing that makes it cool is this. See, because if you had drawn the humans... 12 or 15 times as big. Um, 
then this monster wouldn't be as intimidating. But because, and if you have removed, if you remove the humans from the image, if like you completely take them away, you don't get that sense of scale. You don't get the sense of like, holy shit, this thing is the size of like a skyscraper. This, this, this thing is absolutely fucking overwhelmingly massive and terrifying. But because we have humans for scale, better than bananas anytime, um, <clears throat> this thing just becomes this huge, looming, overwhelmingly terrifying thing. And I think that's pretty cool. Back to Bilgewater for a second. And another guy that people have been thirsting on a little bit. For obvious reasons, I think. Uh, <laughs> so again, framing and lighting. Note how the little minion creatures, whatever the hell these things are, that are slavering around in the background. You notice how the light here is warm and kind of reddish orangish. Then we transition over here and you can still see that orange reddish light on his pecs if you look really closely at his pecs for a long time. Um, but the light also gets much more white and much more washed out. By the way, I think this guy's supposed to be like a, a great white shark character. I think this is his tail over here somehow. Don't know how exactly that works with his anatomy, but you know. He's a goblin shark. Yeah, probably a goblin shark. He can probably he can probably do the alien thing of like poking his mouth out, which is very cool. I like the top hat. That really gives him a lot of character that he has the top hat of all things on top of everything else. Uh, kind of a Baron Samedi kind of thing going on. Uh, but yeah, framing. There's a little bit of, of like uh, the environment framing the character. Not so much though, just highlighting him there. And again... Creating a position of dominance over all the all the characters. His eye line is way above ours, but it's also above every single other member of the scene. Like you have all these little workers, but none of them are positioned above him ever. They are all below him all the time, which again creates the scene of dominance and domination. And yeah, he's probably going to be a, a, a Tom Kench follower once Tom Kench is added. And then we get this. There's two things I, I, I love immediately about this image. First, I love the posing on the girl, the Moon Dreamer. I love the posing on her. I love that weird kind of crab, like, like really hunched over, strange, like, it's like a crunchy pose. I f crunchy is the word that keeps coming out. It's like, it's like, it's like cr slightly crunchy, kind of weird and off-putting, combined with this giant horned mask and this single glowing um, solar uh, lunar eclipse symbol in the middle. That almost acts like an eye, a single cyclopic eye in the in the face of the of the girl's mask, which is like a, just a cool character design. The second thing I like is the fucking cat's expression. Look at him! He's like, "What the fuck? Why is she dancing on my back? What the hell?" He looks so surprised. <laughs> which I just think is is excellent. Anyway, again, framing. We have the pedestal, and then we have like the the moon itself in the background, creating this performance space for the character. And we have the lighting, of course, doing the job of highlighting where the character is. So, here again, we are back with Tiari, his Noxian companion, and his Demacian companion. I, I don't remember their names. I'm bad with names. Doesn't matter. Who cares? But here we see that Tiari has conjured magical climbing implements for them to use as they try to scale the mountain, which I think is a cool little detail. And again, composition. Clever little thing being done here. The magical climbing implement is glowing with purple light. And purple is a color that just doesn't exist in this environment. Everything here is gray and white and brown because it's the middle of a snowstorm on the side of a mountain. So you have this lead, this line, literally running through the image that pulls your attention through each of the three characters in turn. The most important character who's up front, the secondary character who's following right after, and then the tertiary character right here at the back. And they're ranked basically in order of visual importance to the image itself. Um, because here, the focus of the image, the main character of the image is her, and then the other two are bit players in this particular image. Tiari's journey is the more important one, obviously, but, you know. Um, so yeah. It's good, just very clever little compositional trick to like let the literal rope that they're holding onto anyway be the guiding line that that pulls your eye through the image. <laughs> I 
Then we have this absolute unit. And again, remember how we talked about crowd scenes like uh, 10 or 15 million times already? Same thing going on here. Every other character in the crowd scene, something overlaps them. Something like that blocks them out. Something gets in the way of them. Our main character is not overlapped by anything ever. <clears throat> he stands out, quite literally. Um, there's a little bit of, of lighting. You can see the other characters are more washed out. He's more saturated with his colors, and he's more... Uh, He's center of the image. He's just the center of the image uh, as a whole. And there's a little bit of a frame with like this giant cliff in the background and this arch right here creating this kind of a space for his upper body to occupy that creates a compositional center for him to be in. That mountain image is the last Tiari card. Nope, no it's not. There is one more. Look, he's all grown up. Look how cool he is now. Badass. Ah, lovely. Not a lot of composition in this image. Like, the composition is basically just where the character is placed. There's a little bit with the clouds, the space clouds here in the background, but mostly we just have, like, a, a very basic um, golden ratio cut, like, where the, cent the the character's head is placed more or less in the intersection between two, um, two cuts in a golden ratio over here, which just uh, centers him nicely in the image. We've got the spread out wings making him big and majestic and resplendent and cool. And that all works really well. And he's also color differentiated from the rest of the image. He's got this bright blue, purple, sparkly thing going on. The rest of the background is much more drab, much more red, much more dark. So, theoretically, this is the dragon, or the same kind of dragon, that um, Fiora and Garen were fighting on the bridge in the Tales from Runeterra Demacia short. I'm not 100% sure that that's true necessarily, but it's certainly a very similar looking dragon. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So, compositionally, we have two main characters. We have uh, the dragon itself, and then we have Santa Claus running away from him. Um, and so Santa Claus over here has this bit right here, like this little bit of the environment, giving him a little bit of a frame, uh, like giving him a little bit of breathing room and space to be in as he's running desperately through the environment. And the dragon itself gets pride of place and priority, essentially by just being really fuck off big. Like just, just absolutely huge as it chases around Santa Claus to indulge its war fetish. Um, just it's, it's very big in the image and that's really all it needs, but it's also color differentiated from the background because like it's its scales on its head have more or less the same color as the stones in the foreground, but the stones in the background are washed out. They are less dark um, than the scales on its actual head. Yeah, it's a, it's an egg thief. It stole it's, it's he has stolen a dragon egg. That's why he's being chased. But um, but it's also color differentiated like it's all brown and orange and like sort of warmer and brighter colors where everything else is like green and dark gray. No, I mean, you look at this mouth. I, I know Vore artists. I'm friends with a few of them, and this is how a Vore artist will draw a mouth. Like, well, maybe with a little bit more drool, but that's basically how they'll do it. <laughs> so, composition again. The troll warrior's shoulder, like the, the foreground troll warrior here, and then the staff of the priest itself creates this space up here where there's like a clear background with practically nothing happening in it to distract from the central character of the image, which is the augur of the old ones, the troll guy, right here. Uh, so compositionally here, very simple. We got a little bit of, an, of a uh, tilted angle again, which again I think is to help widen the space a little bit, to open it up a little bit more, to give especially more headroom to the troll over here. Um... Oh, female troll. Yeah, you're right. Female troll again. I got you baited. I'm just so not used to, like, seeing fantasy art where female monster characters are depicted as actually looking like female monsters. I'm always like, I'm always like, oh, well, if it doesn't look like a hot anime girl, then it's probably not a woman in this game. Blah. Are the celestial cards here? Yes, we'll get to the celestial cards. Um... So once again, a uh, little bit of light lighting being used to draw our attention to the central character, which is the troll priestess, Augur character. And then everyone else, no detailed faces to distract us from the central character of the piece. Then we have this one. And again, 
talk about your framing, you have this narrow uh, horizontal slit in the image, which is like they're hiding in a space between some stuff in uh, like a Solari compound or whatever. Um, that creates like a wonderful letterbox framing device uh, to kind of highlight all of the characters in the image. And so there's two things. Um, first, we have like, uh, like these are all characters in a similar uniform, right? They're all wearing the same colors, more or less. They all have white hair. They all have glowing eyes, etc. Et so they're very similar characters. So how do we make one of them stand out? Well, we put all of the other characters in shadow and then we have them contrasted with like the relatively bright night that's outside. And then we put one character into the actual light and gives the, give them a full complement of highlights and uh, to make them stand out. Plus, again, notice the overlapping thing. This character is overlapped by that character. This character is overlapped by the main character. It overlaps this one, overlaps that one. Nothing overlaps with the main character of the image. It's just a cool composition. Like, and also again, notice how, like I, I was talking previously about put your effort into the thing that matters, which is here. If you zoom in real close on the Lunari in the background here, you'll find that they're not painted with nearly as much care and attention to detail as the central character, because why would you? They don't matter. Sickness is the main character. They matter. Ah, water. So, in Violus Vox. Very cool character. And again, here you can really see the use of color to mark out a character in a composition. Because everything else is all... It's much, mostly purples, grays, blues. In the background, like very cold colors, very sort of subdued colors. And then against that, and against the like blue night sky with a little bit of, of Aurora Borealis going on, you have this bright flare of just absolute fire lighting up the night sky, drawing our attention, and having us, like, pulling us to look at the central character of the image, which is this guy right here. Um, which is very good. And there's also, like, the mountaintop that he's standing on that kind of creates a space here. For the character to occupy and then this just becomes mostly background i also like the little detail that he's not the only uh he's not the only one of his kind he's not the only one standing on a mountaintop and flaring up you can see others in the background as well which is a lovely little bit of of um visual storytelling but yeah this is just like yeah, a really cool character design like i love the the this spin of golden metal whatever the hell it is how it's not even attached to him it just hovers it just hovers around his body. And this looks really badass. That's a cool design for a dragon monster, isn't it? Very different. Like, it's not just a, a generic fantasy dragon of the Western or Eastern varieties. There's some thought going into creating a, a really different aesthetic here. He's almost like a Brontosaurus, almost. Like, he's got kind of that same, same look to him. I am the Sun Guardian, Guardian of the Suns, the Lunari quiver before him. Fuck off! That's a Vine reference. Does anyone remember Vine? Anyone? No? I'm old? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I believe the Sun Guardian is actually supposed to be the ball. Like, I believe the ball itself is actually the Sun Guardian. Some people thought that it was the warrior in front of him. Uh, but no, this is the Sun Guardian. Uh, so, you know. Because it says, Sun Guardian's Inscription. Shining Guardian, your wrath burns like the noonday sun. Come forth and punish those who was trespassed on the sacred black. This is the inscription on the Sun Guardian. The Sun Guardian is the card. Um, so, composition. Well, part of the point of the Sun Guardian is that it's fucking big. Like, it's, it's this huge floating orb that floats in the middle of of the screen and, and like overwhelms and outsizes everything else so there's no frame in the image there's nothing that can contain it it bursts out of the frame of this arch right here because it's too big to even be contained within the image itself i'm cursed with seeing the smiling face in this oh yes <laughs> um 
So in order to communicate the size of it, like to really communicate the scope of how big this fucking thing is, we have this tiny little human standing in front of it. And it also like just bursts out of everything. It's not even really centered in the image in the way that you would normally do. It's just so big that you kind of can't ignore it. Like you have to accept that it is the biggest thing in the entire goddamn damn image. There's also a concentrism, um, which is like you get this, like this this circle of the of the arch. If you imagine that that one was completed as a full circle, you kind of get this going along with kind of the same um, same curvature as the smaller circles on the disc itself, or the, the orb itself, going all the way into the face. So you have the face here that has this frame, which you can kind of spin out a little bit, so you get this almost a solar system where everything else revolves around it. But anyway. Here's another cool image. <clears throat> so this is a Noxian attack on what looks like, I think, the Winter's Claw? Uh, just going by the costume design of the characters that it's fighting against. Um, but there's a clever thing being done with the composition here. The swing of the weapon, like the swing of this of the, of the weapon here, creates this line through the air, and that line also becomes a compositional frame. It also it also becomes like a frame for the basilisk itself, which is the main character of the image to occupy. The main character is not the rider, it's the basilisk. And that's emphasized, like, that's further reinforced by, like, you can you can kind of draw a curve through the um, Winter's Claw Warrior right here. And as well through here. Like, see, it's, it's kind of reinforced by elements in the picture. But the basilisk is the main character, as you can see from the fact that it's literally been circled with a bright line. Which I think is very cool. But this is a secondary character. The rider is a secondary character and who's marked out by the, the brick, bright red cloak against the darkness of the sky in the background. It's a cool image. It's a very cool composition. And again, tilted angle to create uncertainty and being off center, blah, blah, blah. Sichuani skin. Yeah, that would be cool. And here we have someone who's probably not a minotaur. Probably. Probably not a minotaur. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I had a lengthy discussion with Riot Scathlock, uh, Laurie Goulding, who is the narrative editor of League of Legends, where I said, okay, this guy is clearly a Minotaur. Like, look at him. He's a Minotaur. He has three fingers like Alistar does, and he's got a beard, and he's got a big cow nose, and he's got the same anatomy. He's clearly a Minotaur like Alistar. Whereas, where Scathlock said, maybe not. Maybe he's, maybe, maybe, possibly, maybe, he's a Vestaya, <clears throat> which... Okay, I. He looks like Alistar in in cosplay, but. Okay, so he's not necessarily a Minotaur. He might just be a Vestaya, I guess. Anyway, oh, uh, there's a Monson. Ah, thank you. A small donation from a poor student. Thank you. That's more than enough. Thank you. That's very kind of you. So couple of interesting compositional things going on here, because there's two things going on. There's two characters in the image, after all. First of all, there is Grandfather Rumul himself, this giant thing. He's centered in the image. Um, there's no, there's not necessarily a frame around him, but he's centered in the image, and he takes up so much space that he's a dominant character in the picture. But then, the secondary thing he's doing is that he himself is acting as a frame for the little shepherd. The shepherd girl here is framed by the bulk of his body and the curvature of him as he's presenting her with his, her own little herding stick. Um, so he's acting as a frame within the frame for the secondary character, which I think is just compositionally a really cool way to do it. It's a really cool way to use one character to do something for the other one. Which I just think is, is like just very well done. And again, background all washed out, much less saturated. Foreground much more sat uh, generally more saturated. Gets some highlights on the character. Blah blah blah. Same stuff we've talked about before. I thought Minotaurs were Vestayas. I thought so too, but no. Turns out they're not at all. Ah, the infinite mind splitter. So this is a cool monster design again. Like, this is just a really cool monster. It looks like it was cleaved down the middle, right? It looks like it was cut in half. And then you can see its beating heart right at the center. But 
God, it's a cool character design. Because because you can't decide, you can't your eyes can't decide if this is a monster that has been split in two, or if it was supposed like if it was split in two by nature, if it's supposed to look that way. And that inconsistency between what your expectation and what you're actually seeing makes it kind of unsettling, which is a really good thing for this kind of monster. So again, basic compositional stuff. He stands on an outcropping, and he pokes out, and he takes up so much space in the center of the image, and the background is kept clean for him, so obviously he's the central character of the image. And the lighting coming off his back, like this bright pink, reddish, purple fire, whatever the hell it is, helps mark him out um, and, and draw our attention to him as something that is separate from and stands out from the environment. Same thing goes for the bl bright uh, blue glow in his chest as well. God, it's just cool. Like, it's just such a fucking cool monster. That rules. <laughs> Here again, um, same basic compositional tricks we've talked about before. You can see how the background creates a kind of a frame and opening form. And the same thing goes, like, you can kind of draw a line across the heads of the Avarosan warriors, that they're all kind of on the same level, right? Like, you can kind of draw a straight line through all their heads. And that creates, again, sort of a spacing for him to burst into the image. Um, which he does. Like, he's literally bursting into the space. You can see him charging forward and taking over control. And again, he's above them. He's got his arms spread out. He's dominant. He's domineering, which makes him look even more dangerous than he already does by just being, like, way larger than they are. And again, look at the uh, Avarosans down here. If you zoom in close on them, very low detail rendering on the characters. Like, there's not that much work goes into creating detail there, but tons of work has gone into creating detail on the central character. That same lesson again, to remember if you're an artist, put your effort where the effort counts. And here is the final Tiari human picture. That's Tiari right there. Tiari reaches the top of the mountain. His companions don't. And so there he stands, alone, meeting the Arbiter of the Peak. The Arbiter is the mountain's final test, for only the Guardian sees beyond the climber's deeds and into their spirit. This is the moment of judgment, when Tiari is found worthy, and I'm just going to jump ahead here for a second. To become the Traveler. And the Traveler, by the way, is female. They uh, they use uh, she, her pronouns. They, they So, Tiari's narrative throughout the game, uh, the, their, the narrative of their climb up Mount Targon to, like, to reach the peak and ascend to something... It's a celestial in this case, is a trans uh, narrative. It's a it's a story of transition from one gender identity to another, and that's very much intentional by the writers. They have confirmed this, that this is the intent: is that that Tiari transitions from being a non-binary male character into being a female character, and that's a very cool thing. We'll talk about the the traveler card itself uh, a little bit later, but I just wanted to kind of complete that storyline for you so that you know what's happening in the image itself. Let's see. Uh, again, compositional elements are obvious. We have the... whatever the hell these things are, the pokey horns of the mountain or whatever, creates a frame for the central character to occupy. The central character, which is not Tiari because Tiari is tiny, um, is highlighted with lots of light. It's highlighted by their connection to the bright swirling whatever the hell it is that's floating around magic stuff above them and they are unbothered like they are uncrowded in their own space they have all this empty background air behind them so that they stand out and become central um yeah and the, this is just a cool character design like this is a really cool i love the crystalline structure of it i love that it's a crystal monster Or creature, whatever the hell. It's just it's just a really nice character design. And it's got... I like the symbol on the forehead, which is the concentric circles of the eclipse. 
which is, of course, the central symbol that also haunts Diana and Leona um, throughout their stories. It's a very cool composition. And now we can start in on the Celestials. So, again, framing is obvious. You have, like, this curved line, essentially, through the image. You can kind of trace a curved line this way, creating, a, and like, an open sky against which the serpent here itself can be framed um, as it rises into the image. And the clever thing about the serpent is that you can see its constellation stretching out behind it. Like, you can see the stars that make up the constellation of the serpent connected through the thing itself, which is it's just a very clever little thing. A clever way to do it. And again, tiny human for scale. No, Tiari is not an aspect. Uh, we'll talk about that once we get to the Traveler, but... Uh, the tiny human for scale, making this thing look enormous and overwhelming. Again, tiny human. Tiny human for scale to make this thing look even bigger. And again, same thing with, like, having the constellation itself as a part of the character's design always showing up inside it, which I think is a really clever way to do it for, like, showing celestial characters. Um, but yeah, there's not much to say about it. Again, you have this clear sky being used to frame the character with the ground itself and the mountain acting as a, as a framing device or as the frame within which it can act. And I do like the like the use on the celestial characters, like marking them apart from the sky by having them have brighter, more saturated colors than the sky itself. There's this good boy. Look at that good pupper. Look at him. Look at the good boy. No human for scale, but a dog for scale. Anyway, same thing here. Like, you can, see, you can kind of see how the clouds themselves are being used here to create this circular space for the for the dog to occupy. Um, and again, the constellation being active inside the character as a, sort of a skeleton for the character design, which I think is very clever. Same story here. Pretty much, I don't know if there's anything else to say, except that otters are cool too. But it's the same compositional trick being repeated over and over again. And it works. It's being repeated because it's a good thing. It's it's like a really good way to structure it. And then we get the Traveler. Now, when Tiari climbs to the top of the mountain, they do not become an aspect. They don't ascend to being an aspect. They ascend to being a Celestial. Um, which is a different thing. Like, the the aspects are also, like, celestial things. Like, they're from the celestial realm, but they possess... Specifically, aspects possess mortals. They possess them, and then they act in the world. So, Leona is possessed by the aspect of the sun, or fused with it, or whatever. But Tiari does not fuse with a celestial. Tiari becomes a celestial. Tiari becomes the Traveler. We were always one and the same. We were separated only by the mountain, the journey, and a sea of stars. And here, we don't have humans for scale. We have a planet for scale. Multiple planets for scale, actually. Tiari got swole! And also, as people are pointing out in chat, yes, there's definitely a color affinity where they're using the trans flag colors um, very deliberately, on this particular character especially. So, I'm not 100% sure what the story is with this. The strongest star in the night sky, they say, is that of the warrior. An ancient being thought immortal who descends from the stars to prove his worth in combat. Never has he been beaten, but all stories must end and all stars must die. It might be Pantheon, down here, challenging him. Maybe. Um... But I'm not 100% clear on it. Because, and I don't know which pantheon it is either. It could be Atreus, uh, Atreus, but it could also be the previous pantheon. It's not, we don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly where this is supposed to be placed in the lore. But anyway, 
same compositional tricks. Like we have the ground being kind of used to create this little bit of a frame on it. And then you have this badass looking cloak thing going on because the cloak itself is a nebula. You see how like it's it's the it's the cloudy nebulous of the sky that it kind of diffuses out into as it stretches across the heavens. Like it's a really fucking cool character design. Yeah, the spear is the same as Pantheon's spear, which is why I'm not sure exactly how this relates to Pantheon specifically. Um, but it doesn't matter. It looks cooler than Pantheon. Old Pantheon. Anyway. This is Atreos being chosen by the aspect. Is it Pantheon? Okay, cool. That's cool. Good to know. Uh, but again, bright orange and flames and red, which, by the way, in terms of color coding, um... This is, like, uh, he's coded with the colors of war. Like, unlike pretty much all of the other celestial aspects that we've seen so far, which are all blue and purple and blue and purple and purple and blue and purple and blue, um, this guy is all fire and red and, like, ugh. These are the colors of blood. These are the colors of fire. These are the colors of war. So that makes sense for a warrior character. So then we have the two sisters. The golden sister... And I believe the other one's called the Silver Sister. And this, again, is a Diona, uh, Diona Liana, um, Li Leona Diana thing. Thank you very much, Mouth. Where the the point of the story, there's a, there's a poem that goes along with it. From the heavens two beings came, one was robed in silver's glow, the other clad in golden flame. Though they were formed of cosmic, though both were formed of cosmic light, they fought for they were two alike, and so these two split night from day, so each could always have their way. So this is again a thing that's supposed to be related um, to Leona and Diana's storyline, in the sense that they are they are actually a unity. They are things that are supposed to be together, but which are split apart primarily by ego. So that's this part of the, the, the storytelling that's going on there. <clears throat> um, but then also there's the color coding. This one, with like being the sister of the sun, the golden sister, is all color coded with reds and oranges and so on and so forth, which is also the colors of the Solari. Whereas over here, blue, silver, gray, same colors as the Lunari. So there's like, again, there's this very effective through line, aesthetic through line through all of the cards, um, very carefully coding colors to specific, um, to specific parts of the mythos. <clears throat> Right, there were some donations and stuff. Uh, Bapper, God, college loans and healthcare documents suck so much to do. Thanks for keeping me sane, bud. I'm happy to help. Also, quick question. Are all aspects celestials, but not all celestials are aspects? Yes, that is correct. I was curious because of Tiari becoming an ascendant. They did not. They ascended to become an, uh, to become a celestial. They didn't, as they didn't become an ascendant. I love Diona and Lyanna. They are my favorite champions. Yes, I know. Shut up. <laughs> I don't know that these are the aspects... Uh, I don't know if these are the Celestials that possess Leona and Diana. I don't know. I don't think that's been confirmed. Now, the Destroyer. So here there's a mixing. <clears throat> Why did Tiari become a Celestial versus an Aspect? Because Targon judged her to be worthy of becoming a Celestial. Because Targon says so, basically. So here's a bit of a mixing, because the destroyer here, if you take a look at compared with the warrior, for example, take a look at the color temperature. And what you see on the destroyer is that, yeah, there's still some orangey, yellowish reds there, but they're also tinged much more with purple and pink and blue. There's much more of that sort of bluish thing going on, um, which associates the space rhino here as like, it's kind of a mixing of, like, the reds of the warrior sun, but then also something like the charger. And because the charger also has this strong pink-purple element in it, I feel like it's essentially sort of visually, this is essentially like, I'm you, but more powerful um, kind of thing going on, where, like, this is like an upgraded version <laughs> of the thing. So a couple of cool things going on here, like the sense of motion and movement. Um, you can see, like, look at the shooting stars here in the background. Look at the motion blur on the meteors. Look at, like, the lines of the image. All the lines of the image 
have this kind of quality to them. They all follow the motion of the rhino itself. So you get this real great sense of speed moving through the universe, even though there's no speed lines on the image. Like, there's no, like, comic aesthetics in terms of putting speed lines on the character to show movement, but just the state of the environment implies it for you. That's a large bird. That's a large bird! Bigger than a planet, very large bird. Don't know much to say about it. Like, I think we've talked about everything here like, with the warrior already. Kind of talked about many of the same things. It's a, The color is contrasted against the background. It's just so big that it becomes the de facto... Well, there's one thing interesting. Um, we've talked so many times about framings. Here, the wings themselves of the character creates this empty space frame for the head to occupy. Whereas, like, with the wings, they overlap each other. There's a little bit of muddiness in terms of the separation on that that stuff exactly. But the head is kept very clear, so you can see the expression of the bird, which is this triumphant roar kind of thing. Then we have uh, Tentacle Monster Aurelian Sol. Not really sure how to parse this guy uh, from a lore perspective. Um, but apparently he was made by Aurelian. My favorite constellation, I like to think that it will be the first to rain down upon this forsaken mountain. Where there's a little bit of a frame thing going on. You have this this horizon star thing, whatever the hell is going on over here, highlighting its face. Like, you have this bright light right here where its head and its face is supposed to go. And then you have, like, everything in the, in the universe kind of swirling around it. Like, you can see these concentric circles kind of emanating from where its body is bursting through this nebula. Um, so, like, there's, there's, there's a lovely little bit of composition going on here. And also there's the separation in color. You can see how the nebula is all, like, reds and browns. Uh, lots of reds and browns, lots of black, lots of dark, dark blue. And then this thing has this bright, saturated purple tentacle thing coming off of it. And then there's the Baron. I mean, that's it. This this is the Baron. Like, this is literally the Baron. Uh, I don't know why he's a Celestial. There's been no lore explanation for it. Uh, what the Baron on Summoner's Rift is supposed to be, but... Eh, who cares? Doesn't matter that much, but uh, say hello to the Baron. He's the most powerful Celestial. Um, but yeah, that's him. <laughs> Anyway, not a lot to say about the composition, except to say that you can see how all these S-curves, right? Like these swooping curves that are happening. Notice how the heads themselves, like the multiple heads, it all kind of swirls around the central head. Like they all kind of, they kind of have this circular motion around the central head, which helps keep that as like, you can tell that this is the main head just by looking at it, right? Kind of thing. You get the feeling of it immediately. Yeah, the Baron used to be a real creature that lived on Runeterra, but that was in the previous state of the lore, as someone says in the chat very correctly. Um, but now it's a Celestial, and there's a guess, but the Baron on the Summoner's Rift is Void creature? Uh, uh, I don't... How the lore is going to shake out on this one, I don't even want to speculate on, because I have no idea. Plus, Summoner's Rift isn't canon anyway, so... Hmm. But yeah, that's the last one, and I think... I mean, I kind of ran out of new things to say... With the Celestials, like, I think I've already kind of pointed out everything that's there. Except to say that this guy is not a constellation. Uh, that's one thing. Is that, um, the constellation stopped happening with the Trickster. After that, even with, the uh, even with the Charger, they're not constellations anymore. They are creatures that exist beyond constellations, I guess. They contain stars, but they're not, like, you don't have these little star lines through them. Whew! Well, that only took three hours. Ha! <laughs> huh, I think we're done. Actually, I think that was that was that was it. Unless, um, chat, is there anything you want me to take a second look at? Is there any questions? Anything you want to talk about? Anything you want to ask about?
666 likes. No, 674, as far as I can tell. Oh, you just joined. Yeah, I'm sorry. You should have been here earlier. The VOD will be up, don't worry. Oh, I left you a donation. Oh, oh, uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Did I miss it? No, it's not showing up in my feed yet. I guess it'll show up in a, in a second. I hope you're not in pain from talking too much. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I had my tea. I'm okay. We won't do the spells. There's really nothing interesting to say about any of them. Like, it's, oh, it's a sword. It's fire. It's some gremlins. Oh, look, it's a face made of people. I, 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 don't, I don't have anything interesting to say about the spells, I don't think. How are you doing emotionally? It sounds like you're in a rough situation. I'm okay. I'm fine. Like, <clears throat> my, my bank account is a little fucked because of the surgery I had to have, but uh, I'm fine. That's about it. It was via Streamlabs, so I'm not surprised it hasn't... It was Streamlabs. Okay. Uh, let me check, check Streamlabs to see if I can find it. I don't want to miss people's donations. I hate doing that. Let's see. Is it the, it's a shame your lovely speech is stifled by stitches, but here's some money for tea and honey, because that one didn't show up in my Streamlabs app, which I'm a little annoyed about. Hope your bank account gets better. Yeah, it will. It'll be fine. Oh, the softest bear. Thank you. I joined the stream, tuned into the KDA reveal, then had an online class and then came back and you're just now finishing. Amazing, I love your work. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Oh, Poro Cannon. We can take a look at that one, because that's that's going to be in all of my decks from now on. Every single goddamn one. And it's a cute little illustration. Like, there's a bit of storytelling there. With the poor thing with its ass pointing out. <laughs> and this guy going, Ha ha, I'm about to fire you to the sky. Which is the daring Poro, obviously. It's a little bit of a story there. I don't think her level 2 head is that weird. Like, it's it's a Yordle head. They're all weird. They're all too big. They, they, they don't make any anatomical sense. That's... It's like... Them's the breaks with Lulu. We've talked... We talked extensively about this at the start of the stream, but this one is the one that has the more problems because of the tangent lines and stuff like that. But you can look that up in the VOD. Lore gameplay for the finisher... No, I, I, I'm just... This is the outro. We're about to stop the stream. Isn't it a lore problem that Aurelian Sol is far too overpowered? Yeah, well, sorta, except, like, not really, because well, he's once he's free from Tarkon's control, he can just fuck off. Like, he doesn't have to stay on Runeterra at all. The problem that you have with Aurelian Sol is that it's really hard to tell stories about him that are set on Runeterra, because, like, what the fuck would he do on Rune? He's the size of a galaxy, like, he, he's the size of a planet, like... What would you tell kind of what kinds of stories would you possibly tell about him? He can be a character in other people like he can show up as a cameo, I guess, in celestial themed stories and stuff, but it would be hard to tell stories about him on Rune Terra. So, you know. Hey Sky, love your videos. I have insomnia and anxiety issues, but your videos are soothing and help me sleep. Well, you're very welcome. I hope the robot voices haven't been too disconcerting for you recently. I wish the female Yordles were as furry as the male ones. Yeah. Like, it's dumb. It's dumb. Like, it, the sexual dimorphism thing is dumb. I don't like it, but uh, whatever. Uh. Have you seen the anime short from World of Warcraft released today? No, I haven't looked at it yet. As far as I remember, it's just an animatic, isn't it? Shivana's story is a human took her egg from a dragon. Do you think that dragon card in Demacia is the is the beginning of Shivana? No, I think it's just another egg thief. Like, I think people steal egg eggs from dragons on, like, a regular basis, probably. <laughs> ah, the female trolls were a pleasant surprise. Yes. We have already done KDA. We have already watched the, the video. We're not doing it again. Read Aurelian's spell. Oh, right. 
When the time comes, I think I'll make an example of Runeterra. Perhaps I'll drag its smoldering husk around with me for all eternity. Like a toy. A dead, worthless toy. I don't know. I've not thought about it much. <laughs> Very funny. Anyway, um, yeah. Have you watched League of Legends Tarkon animation? Yes, I have. I've watched it. The animation breakdown will wait. I'm gonna have to rest my mouth a little bit after this just to make sure I don't overstrain my, my stitches or anything. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I'm gonna play an ad and then the stream is gonna end. Thank you all very much for tuning in, guys. I hope you had a good time. I certainly did. <laughs>